now. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, let me see. I have to. Ah, how do I do this? I have to. Ah, I have to share the screen first. But okay, share screen. Okay. I go here. Uh, share. All right. And now I start the not uh, little Richard, whom I love, but um, with uh, Paul Andre. Come on, open Paul Andre. Okay. So you, you probably see it and we'll start with the first slide. So it is his birthday, as I said. So we wish him, all of us will wish him happy birthday. Um, he is uh, really, uh, to use a word uh, that uh, uh, Kenneth Frampton used vis-a-vis -vis Adolf Loss, an enigma. And I think it is appropriate to use this word about Paul Andre. He is an enigma. He was an enigma. A very accomplished architect, but he was also a writer. Apparently, he published even fiction and also painted. Uh, 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 so he was also a painter, but he was also an engineer and he built airports. So no surprise, he said that, um, you know, he needed several lives. Well, he only got one. But he made the most of it. And I think uh, in this respect, he's a role model, so to speak. But he's a model, uh, 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 um, uh, an enigma also from other points of view, uh, a little more subtle, and I hope I can uh, address them a little later on. He was an enigma for me, and he still is a little bit. Okay, so uh, in French, uh, you know, I found this expression about him, Paul André, an architect, he don't design. This is because he built airports, so it, it, it gives you uh, wings, so to speak. This, these are the rhetorics of uh, newspapers. Then Paul André, I would only take on, and this I mentioned, I would only take on a project if the ideas were mine. Otherwise, I am not interested. So, talking about uh, egocentrism, in the Renaissance, you had great masters working together on the same building, and I'm not saying that in the Renaissance, architects didn't have a big ego. They had. But now, uh, you know, uh, somehow uh, collaboration between um, uh, important or famous architects uh, is, it, it does happen, but it also has problems. And it's maybe not very, uh, not very often it happens. Okay. Now this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure actually, it, it might be that it is an airport that he did uh, and then it is transformed through photoshopping, but I like the picture and it's kind of connected with uh, that quotation that he's the architect who gives, uh, who gives wings, although here the wings are kind of, uh, you know, dark, so to speak. Anyway. This is the gentleman. I always like to start with pictures of the of the person, even fragmented like this. You can count, uh, uh, you know, the hair on his uh, right cheek, if uh, <laughs> if it amuses you. He's an interesting man, and he somehow you wouldn't expect him to to be. I mean, he has a certain uh, uh, melancholia almost, and or. Uh, uh, I don't know why I think of Bernini when I, when I see pictures of him. And there are other pictures even better expressing this uh, strange, uh, uh, kind of strange, almost uh, anachronistic uh, face. Uh, I think he was an interesting and complex man. And even more interesting is the fact that he started his own office at 63. So, until 63, he became famous for building airports, but he worked for a big French co corporation. And he had at one moment, as he declared, 400 people under him. So <laughs> he was kind of like uh, Patrick Schumacher now, you know, once, once um, Zaha Hadid left us, uh, or like Zaha Hadid, who had, um, you know, 400, 450 people employees. Well, they were not his employees, but they were under him. He was responsible for a very large team. And he declared that uh, at 63, he, he, he got tired of airports 
after he built 25 airports. Can you believe it? 25 airports, but he designed around 60. So, <laughs> you know, an airport is not an easy matter. It's not a small little hut, uh, you know, in the mountains. It's, it's a very complex and very large uh, uh, program. He built 25, and at 63, as I said, he got tired. And so he opened his own office, but he was also spoiled by China because he began to receive very large commissions in China and he felt obliged uh, towards China, so much so that for uh, his biggest accomplishment in China, that is the, the big national uh, performing arts center in Beijing, he actually did some uh, ceramic tiles. He engraved some tiles for that big, big, big project with his own hand. Something he said he always wanted to do. He always wanted to do with his head, but also with his hands, and not necessarily in this order. I, maybe he was ill here, but he, I like his uh, discreet elegance, uh, and uh, I don't know, it's something about him that I like, but he's still an enigma for me. And uh, I'm attracted by enigmas, uh, so uh, I will continue to learn about him. But for now, I will present to you what I know. This is a port uh, painting by him, uh, of him, a self-portrait. Uh, and uh, now we, we look at some drawings. The drawings are maybe not very impressive, but um, uh, anyway. Some of them are so-called visionary, you know, uh, they, they are visionary, visionary drawings, at least this is, this is one of them. Uh, this is less visionary, this is actually a plan, I think it's the airport Charles de Gaulle in Paris, one of his earlier works, but an excellent work. And if you go to Paris and if you land in uh, Charles de Gaulle, you'll be right there in the work uh, of uh, Paul André. Other drawing, um, other drawing, um, anyway. He also wrote a book, De Lettre à un jeune architect. Uh, I don't know why is par Fata Morgana, there is par Paul André uh, Fata Morgana. It's probably an interesting uh, book. What I read is that he also was an accomplished writer. I mean, uh, uh, fiction, not theoretical uh, um, works. This is, uh, again, the man with, um, with a, a sketch that was, uh, um, you know, scaled up uh, on a wall or in an exhibition. He does look like an intense man, an introverted man. I mean, it is remarkable. This man who built 25 airports was also a civil engineer and also a, a fiction writer and also a painter. And uh, <laughs> anyway, now we start with this. What is strange in a way, uh, wait a minute, I'm a little bit confused, um, because this presentation has something unique and I almost apologize, uh, I, I probably have to apologize. I start with his latest work. That's how I built the PowerPoint presentation. I, 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 I moved backwards, not forwards. I don't know exactly why I did so. Because I was intimidated, I think, by the list of uh, his works, on Wikipedia, the French one, which had many more works, but he, I, at least half of them were actually competition entries. He did a lot, uh, did a, lo a lot of works for competitions, and I imagine some of them, or most of them, he didn't win. But um, now, this was just, I wanted to start with this one, but this one will be actually at the end, because as I said, although the, the work itself lasted until 2003. But I will start with his last, latest work, the one that, that he did just before he died. And it's a Cité Municipal, it's a municipal uh, building, uh, um, you know, a governmental building in Bordeaux in France, perhaps not very impressive. You know, you have seen such architectures you almost feel tempted to think that that pole is supporting the cantilevered uh, part of the building. It is not. Uh, that, that's what I thought be, um, at first, but uh, it's in, in the foreground, that, that pole. So please uh, make abstraction a bit. It's, it's a building like you have seen uh, maybe many times. 
But he was, I think, an excellent organizer. I mean, to do an airport properly, you do have to be a, an excellent organizer. And by the way, he was the consultant for uh, Renzo Piano uh, in, uh, um, in, in Japan for the airport that uh, um, uh, Renzo Piano built there. So, he, of course, he had a lot of experience. You have to handle very well, uh, um, um, you know, circulations and many other complex functions. He was probably very good at it. You are surprised, and I am surprised that the same man also wrote fiction. Maybe he also wrote poetry, and he also painted. Bravo to him. I think we need such people with, uh, with various uh, uh, interests, equally intense in all of them, and, uh, and uh, in other words, not, uh, you know, uh, just uh, scratching the surface of uh, some other domains. No, being uh, present in them, so to speak, like a true Renaissance person. Inside the building is though more interesting than the outside, I think. Uh, um, I kind of like it, you know, it's, yes, it is symmetrical, yes, it is, uh, you know, uh, civilized, but it is supposed to be civilized because it's a governmental building, but it, it has character and it has honesty and I, I think it's okay. Maybe it's not a masterpiece, but uh, it's not a work to be uh, necessarily um, timid about or ashamed of. Anyway, now we uh, arrive at the... Uh, the Jinan Chin. Hello? Please be kind and turn off the, the microphone because uh, um, otherwise we create <laughs> more chaos here than um, we should. Anyway, we go now to a, a building that is uh, um, almost a signature building by him in China after he opened his own office. Uh, it was built in to, between 2010 and 2013, the opera in, in Jinan. Uh, you can after you, you, you see several works by him, you kind of understand that he had a certain formal uh, 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 interest in, 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 in I mean, the, the, he's a, he could be a little bit predictable, I think, and that is maybe a, a weaker part of his, his work. But um, he also loved uh, uh, novelty, but not for the sake of novelty, of course, such, such buildings uh, are being built and were built in the last years in China. Uh, he had immense success in China. He was even uh, uh, um, uh, given a teaching position at a very high level uh, um, in architecture, and he was flooded with commissions. And he was very uh, grateful to China that it had confidence in him. Now, uh, yes, many architects built in China, and uh, uh, you know it was their, their luck that China opened up uh, at least uh, you know to some uh, signature pieces by signature architects. Uh, and I, I actually think that um, I don't know. I mean, it was China's way to accelerate its coming into modernity, I guess. But the, the, the richest part of China is actually the village. And there are thousands of villages that have been uh, uh, um, abandoned. And there is immense potential there, not in, in the big cities, but in their villages. I have a book from 1920s published by the Germans, a beautiful book with old China. And uh, uh, I, I saw the unbelievable beauty in, uh, in uh, otherwise impoverished vi villages, but extremely uh, uh, interesting and picturesque and romantic and uh, spiritual even with pagodas, you know, scattered over the hills. Very, very, very beautiful. There is an immense potential. China truly has at this point an immense treasure in, his, in its hands. And this is its rural culture. And even uh, Mai Yansong from Med Architects confessed that this is the future for China, not the big cities, the villages. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the, the building, another cultural center. They built a lot of cultural centers, performing arts centers, uh, theaters and operas. Sometimes they are called operas, but they are more than just an opera. Even here you see there are several buildings. Um, yes. Well, again, we have seen buildings kind of similar to this one, even uh, Renzo Piano built in, uh, in Rome, a music center, uh, not, not very dissimilar to this one to an extent. So I guess he was not excessively original, but as, uh, as uh, Miss would have said and did say, uh, the idea is not to, make, to be original, but to, not to do an necessarily an original building, but to do a good building. Uh, and I, I think his buildings uh, 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 function well because uh, trained as he was with airports, I think he was able to handle complex matters um, quite well. And the interior is, uh, is impressive, you know, is uh, uh, um, apparently simple uh, or almost simplistic, but uh, there is a well, well uh, controlled uh, monumentality and even a sense of scale. Uh, I, I think it's a good interior. And uh, he was quite able to handle, um, you know, big spaces, huge spaces, like a, a man who <laughs> built 25 airports. Uh, you know, at the first sight, even the, you know, the, the performance uh, rooms themselves seem, 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 seem to be fine. Um, so there are various, because there are several buildings there. So these are quite ample uh, uh, programs. Uh, the skyscrapers are, or the towers are not his. So this is the, um, the work prior to the last one that he built before he died. Um, an interesting, uh, I don't know what it is, this huge uh, wall uh, for media arts, for some kind of, I don't know, is it an artwork or it displays messages? Maybe someone who is more, in, no, no, more knowledgeable about this than me could, uh, could tell me, could tell us. But you can see the scale, it is huge. If it was in a train station or on the, an airport, you'd have said, you know, the arrivals and, and the departures are announced. But this one is displays maybe, I don't know, the map of the world or uh, I don't know what it is. Anyway, it is huge. Uh, as it is to be uh, in, in China, I guess, unless, as I said, you build in a, in a village. So, uh, China has at, at this point uh, a large amount of operas and theaters and performing arts uh, centers. Uh, you would say that, uh, <laughs> you know, they are going to the theater every day of the week, I wonder, you know because they are very hard working, you know. Uh, anyway, they are ready for the, for the time of, uh, of uh, you know, watching uh, plays and uh, concerts and so on. This is the plan of three uh, buildings of the complex, a section. Uh, so I guess if you know how to handle this carcass, uh, you can make the building almost doesn't matter how, and then you cover it with this um, carcass, which is uh, uh, doing the job. But it helped him that he was also a civil engineer. Okay, the museum, the archaeological museum in Taiwan from 2010, uh, not very dissimilar compared to the previous work, although you will see the, the image uh, of the building or pavilions is a little bit different. Maybe, I don't know, a little bit pop, but uh, discreetly so. I would rather say that it's more about uh, some kind of archetypal architecture 
uh, and he does seem to be have an interest in, in uh, architectonic uh, archetypes. He also has a side which is, you know, you could call it a little bit so-called commercial or predictable, but maybe it's unavoidable when you handle, you know, such large programs. And when your your experience was with, uh, you know, building 25 uh, airports and designing around uh, 60, if I remember correctly. Okay. Here you also have the dialectics between the green and of the grass and the redness of the pavilions. And it's always good, even if you allow me a suggestion, I am a terrible cook, but if you cook and you think about uh, colors of, of, of whatever you are uh, uh, you know, putting on the plate, it does matter. Because if you have a plate where you combine green with red or other colors, it, it, it could become very appetizing also because of the colors, of the chromatics of the dish. I experienced this and I think it is true. But here it's about something else. Now, a uh, complex of casinos, hotel, commerce, bureaus, uh, offices and, and uh, you know, houses, uh, housings in Macau from 2005. Uh, here was not very clear to me. I couldn't find a lot of pictures, uh, but uh, that silhouette there is interesting, but I, I, I'm not sure uh, what is going on there, and I don't have other pictures, and I apologize. Now we have from 2004-2007 a hotel uh, for Oriental Arts in Shanghai, uh, and there are other, other things, so it's a hybrid program. 200 rooms and the center of affairs, business um, center. In English, it was uh, named in this way, Oriental Arts Center in Shanghai uh, from 2000 to 2004. Again, you kind of see what he is about because, uh, uh, you know, this building is, uh, uh, is his in the sense that uh, it's not very dissimilar from the previous ones that we saw. He uses these pavilions that he brings together and the, the pavilions are, maybe the word is not quite appropriate, some are larger than, than others. And there is something organic here, but um, not excessively so. Anyway, uh, large volumes, maybe he could have done even an airport like this and maybe he did. Um, inside Again, I think he's handling very well a sense of monumentality uh, without being really oppressive. And you can also see the structure, uh, at least of the, of, the, of the skin, of the carcass. Uh, um, an interesting architect, you know, maybe not very spectacular, maybe uh, a little bit predictable, but uh, someone you can count on. Um, and I imagine his uh, spaces and his buildings are, uh, are, are functioning well. Again, I think he, he was held by the fact that he was an architect, but he was also, although it wasn't very clear to me what kind of education he received, but he's uh, described as being both a civil engineer and an architect. Kind of sad now. These uh, these these large spaces, you know, for performing arts where there is no one, you know. But uh, I'm sure they could take care of that. So this is the plan, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, Mad Architects did something probably a little more interesting, a little bit, you know, in a similar way, um, but more spectacular. The section. Mm, it's not, uh, it's not uh, flamboyant, it's uh, in fact uh, rather modest, at least in this part of the building. Um, uh, a picture out of focus and I apologize. Uh, this is also mysteriously out of focus, but that's how I found it. And uh, again, a picture that you saw and another picture with this uh, building 
And now we arrive at the, an administrative center uh, again in China. So as I said, this gentleman uh, opened his office at 63. Uh, <laughs> I don't think too many architects did something like this. Um, uh, it's remarkable that at this age, he, uh, uh, he changed his life uh, dramatically. Until then, as I said, he worked for, uh, um, for a large corporation, a French one that built a lot of airports. And now we arrive at uh, the airport in, du no, unfortunately, I couldn't find pictures with this one, but don't worry, you will see a lot of airports. Uh, then uh, another, no, this is, uh, yes, it is a center for Oriental Arts in Shanghai. Sorry, I, uh, uh, this is the same building that we just saw. Uh, and now we arrive at his, uh, uh, most important building, as it is considered, uh, the Grand Theatre, uh, uh, the National uh, Performing Arts Center of, of Be in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Be Beijing. So, National Center for the Performing Arts, or Opera de Pe Peking, uh, Beijing is also known as Pe Peking, uh, from 1997 to 2007. 1999 to 2007. So for eight years, he labored at this building and together with him, an army of people. But they built a, 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 an immense jewel. Uh, it's not seen in this picture as dramatically as uh, uh, is capable of, but you will begin to see that we are dealing here with the most important building in the field of performing arts in China. And uh, it's not a little thing, this uh, uh, economical superpower, China, this huge country with a huge population invested Paul Andrew with a, with a task to, to build its uh, uh, national uh, theater. And this, this only shows how appreciated he was. Uh, so it's, Again, the engineering here is maybe even more important than um, uh, the architectural aspects, although they are not divorced. Here, as in other buildings by him, architecture and engineering are, come together with equal uh, 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 you know, relevance. And, and like it happened you know, in some other uh, times, and I think this is something uh, worth exploring because as opposed to Jean Nouvel, Jean Nouvel, for example, declared kind of recently that in the past, a certain past, let's say 20 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, architecture was supposed to express honestly its structure, but that in, in the later years, let's say in the 21st century or so, uh, archit uh, architecture was good when it hid uh, the, the sophistication and the complexity and in a way that it's structural truth. So this is what Jean Nouvel said that uh, today uh, uh, um, good buildings do not uh, show uh, you know the whole truth about how they were built or about their structure. Anyway, uh, but this is not the case here. You see how the building was built. He's not hiding anything. And the aesthetical values of the structure are uh, uh, obvious and relevant. He also plays in the sense that he plays in an ornamental way, but at the scale of the building, and these are not little ornaments added to the walls, He's uh, uh, an artist who understands uh, also architecture very well, I think. And the interiors are, uh, you know, how to describe them? Uh, you know, maybe decent, but this is not uh, a very appreciable word. Uh, maybe more than that. They are good. I think they are good. A little bit predictable for those who want uh, um, a strong, uh, you know, uh, stimulants or, or, or uh, uh, you know, provocative uh, statements. But you see his honesty. This is an honest builder, 
and an honest uh, architect and artist and an honest engineer who brings together his uh, knowledge about various fields and, uh, and, and does so uh, without a need to impress necessarily, although the scale of the building is in itself um, you know, uh, impressive to say the least. I like this, uh, and this is apparently the Chinese way, the traditional way of uh, showing the facades of a building, you know, just in this way. And so this is the building. This is the National Theater of, uh, of China. And uh, you see the four elevations and you see the top view. This was done in, uh, and, and, and maybe it could be used, this system of, of uh, representing architecture uh, in a legitimate way because it's, it's logical and it's clear. Yes, you have to rotate the, the print in a way, but even this, even this image is kind of interesting. You know, it's, it's a functional diagram. It shows the plans, but it has some mystery and it has some sensitivity. I mean, this I would hang on the wall as a graphic work, you know, uh, with, with graphic values, art, artistic values uh, beyond the description, uh, the section. But he uses the same method, you know, he builds the, the, the architectonic uh, functional organism and then he covers it with this, this uh, cupola or carcass that is um, most of the time you know, round. Some would say, well, it seems uh, a little bit too simple or simplistic, uh, but um, I don't know because there are images of this building that are very impressive. Um, and they do represent the, you know, the, the proudness of technology today. I'm not so sure about this interest where, but maybe, you know, he, you, when you enter, you actually do not see the, the splendor of the building. It's a little bit hidden. Maybe that's, that's the correct uh, uh, strategy. It's just that this entrance uh, at the bottom, uh, is uh, we saw the first picture, seems to be a little, um, I don't know, uh, not, not inviting enough for my taste. But, but on the other hand, I think it's a good strategy to not betray, to not reveal everything from the beginning. So you offer the surprise once you pass by uh, through this uh, threshold, through above this threshold, through this entrance, uh, then you will have the discovery of uh, what this building is. Uh, also, I noticed something now since I've been doing these PowerPoint presentations and some of them are about China. Uh, the Chinese seem to be very fond of, uh, of uh, having water in cl the close proximity of buildings. In fact, many of their buildings, of uh, important buildings, are built on water. And this is, uh, um, so this is something worth thinking about. Uh, I, I don't think too many countries do this. And I think the vicinity between the, the, the closeness between building and water is, a, is, a, is a, um, an inspiring one. Of course, that water is brought artificially there, as you can see, it's not, uh, but yeah, I think that the Chinese love this, to have a building uh, uh, communicate and be in, in the vicinity of water. And yes, the water allows for uh, uh, reflections and also uh, softens even the harshest, uh, uh, you know, architectonic image. Also the water, I don't know if you know, but it's an occasion for me to suggest to you to read Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, the great uh, uh, philosopher, uh, you know, uh, paradigma paradigmatic figure of the Chinese uh, uh, spiritual landscape. Together with Confucius, Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, his name is written uh, and is spelled a little differently, either T-Z-E 
E or T Z U. Uh, I, I have great affection for Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, and I will explain in a few words to you why. Apparently, and I'm, fa I'm not an expert in uh, Chinese uh, spirituality, but I did read a little book that Lao Tzu wrote, meaning the Tao, and maybe you heard about it, the Tao of life, uh, which is an unbelievably beautiful and poetical and wise little book. It's very small. It only has 80 sayings almost. It's not a treatise. It's not a, you know, a big book. It's a very discreet book. And it was written apparently by the wise man of China. Uh, China had traditionally two wise men. One was Confucius, who was the ethical figure and the, 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 the pragmatic uh, philosopher, and then you had the mystic who was Lao Tzu, and the legend says that Lao Tzu or Lao Tse was the uh, um, the responsible for the library of the of the emperor, and when he was eighty or so, he, when he was older, he left the city, the capital, and at the at the gate, uh, the the you know the the keeper of the gate told him, uh, 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 wise man, uh, I am not allowing you to leave unless you put down your wisdom in a book. So apparently the Tao of life is spelled T-A-U, uh, T-A-O. Um, that's how it was born. I mean, this is the legend. But because I remember this in connection with water, I will... Uh, attempt to tell you in a very few words what is the relationship between water and Lao Tzu. His philosophy is based on this. It is called the philosophy of the weak or weakness. And he says, water seems to be weak compared to the stone. But the truth is, water in time erodes even the stro strongest rock. And it is true. He also said that a blade of grass, when the thunderbolt strikes, resists, survives, while the, the proud oak, the masculine proud oak, dies uh, when, when the thunderbolt strikes it. So his entire uh, philosophy stresses the strength, the, the intrinsic subtle power of what we call usually weak or weakness is really a, a beautiful little book. And I, I, I repeat again, I, I strongly recommend that you read it. It was translated in many languages, if not all the languages of the world. The problem is, it's hard to find a good translation. I read myself two or three um, uh, translations and only one Seemed, seemed closer to me in the sense that I, I understood it better. Otherwise, it's mysterious, but it's very, very beautiful. And I, I will end uh, uh, by telling you that actually this little book at one point saved my life. When I was very, very depressed, I was living in the United States and I was kind of a, uh, um, struck. Well, I was never an oak, but I had some illusions that I was solid and, uh, and I had some, you know, uh, verticality and power and then troubles came in. So as I was kind of, uh, kind of like that oak that was uh, struck by the thunderbolt. And because of Lao Tzu who showed me that even if you are humbled by life, and we all are sometimes in our lives, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can resist, you can, you can uh, reinvent yourself, starting from, uh, from the bottom, in a way, with the wisdom of the blade of grass or water. Enough with Lao Tzu. We go back to the big uh, performing uh, arts uh, uh, center in Beijing. And it has interesting things, this play with concavity and convexity, which is always good to employ because it brings in dynamism and, and it is actually about the yin and yang since we are talking about China. So if you have a concave curve and then a convex curve, 
uh, if you try to play with them, uh, something uh, interesting might uh, uh, might help you. It's a, I think it's a good building, and yes, uh, uh, it seems kind of simple, but uh, uh, considering uh, um, you know the the sophisticated technology used and the scale and the ample spaces and the ample functions that he had to solve, I think he did well. And this is the, um, you know, the plan with a little bit of its ambiance or, or the environment uh, section is not so good. You, we, we look again uh, at, uh, at an image, then uh, this one, it changes. It's, uh, it's covered with titanium and it, titanium and it is, uh, I don't know exactly how they do it. Uh, I saw pictures and you'll see one too, which is totally blue. And uh, we see it in this way. Uh, so I guess this mysterious uh, uh, unidentified uh, flying object uh, could, uh, could have some camele chameleonic qualities. Look at this, it's the same building. Now, I don't know if it was, uh, the photograph was um, manipulated uh, or not. Um, maybe not, but, but the proximity of the water allows for this uh, uh, holistic or whole image being produced from uh, the conjunction of the real building and its reflection on water. Now we see a gymnasium uh, from 1998 and 2001. Uh, also that he did after he opened his office, his own office. Uh, here he tried to mimic a little bit the hills in the proximity of this city. Um, as you kind of see here. Uh, and uh, here again, the structure is, is impressive and honestly, uh, um, uh, externalized, as you can see here, uh, but he doesn't have the, 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 the flamboyance of Calatrava, and this is something I like. Yes, he is uh, uh, using uh, structure in, uh, you know, at a large scale, uh, and it is exposed, but without that expressionism technique, as it was called, of Santiago Calatrava. Now we see something built in Japan by him, the Osaka Maritime Museum, 1998 to 2000s. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the, the same kind of architecture. Uh, 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 sorry for, the, I don't know why people didn't focus better, but you see it here uh, uh, in a better way. So, um, yeah, he he deserved the luck, but he also had the luck of big commissions in uh, in uh, coming from uh, various countries, and uh, the, you know this is an encouragement for anyone who wants to have a full life and to earn earn one's life. It is possible through passion, through hard work, through seriousness, through sensitivity. Uh, if you dedicate your life. To, to architecture in this sense, sooner or later, uh, uh, you know, I think some, some good uh, uh, results would happen. Uh, but I, it is important also to have, uh, to, 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 to desire, you know, to, to, to want more. And I think the last image of this presentation is with a quotation from him or a quotation of, uh, of someone about him that he always wanted to discover something new. And this is something true about any great uh, artist or architect or writer or poet or engineer or, or you name them. There is this curiosity, this continuous desire to, 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 to explore something new. That is the child within who asks questions and want, wants something else. In other words, they do not like the dogmatic uh, uh, way of life. They hate dogmas. They want creativity and uh, nature uh, uh, is a great lesson of uh, uh, every year uh, rejuvenating itself. And I think we should do the same thing uh, or try to do the same thing to, 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 
uh, rejuvenate ourselves. Okay, so uh, Paul Andre again, uh, again an unfocused picture, but that's how I found it. It seems this cupola was actually built uh, not on place, but was brought at least parts of it, uh, but a major, I mean, important part, and was, uh, uh, you know, descended from the sky, so to speak, on the building. Uh, what else do, how else am I to interpret this picture? But this is a very large uh, object, if I can call it so, prob probably inappropriately. Now, we arrive at his other masterpiece, which was an earlier one. As I said, this presentation started with his latest buildings and moves towards his beginnings. And he built three airports or three terminals at Charles de Gaulle Airport. This is the earliest from 1967. No, it's not the earliest, sorry. Uh, or is it? I think it's the earliest, but, but they continue to work and add, and so it actually lasted uh, uh, the work there until 2000s and something, and, and, and they will continue to work. But what he did from 1967 to 1974 is very interesting. From afar, and if you arrive in Paris by plane, they, uh, Paris is served by um, uh, a few airports, but it might be that you land here. Uh, and from the outside, maybe it's not so impressive, but inside is very interesting and we'll see pictures of it. It's interesting that in, in those years, he played with his, uh, uh, um, you know, connections, uh, 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 these bridges uh, so freely, you know, uh, you would say that maybe almost a deconstructivist to do something like this. Well, he did it with 50 years uh, earlier. And uh, uh, a courageous, uh, um, you know, manipulation of functions and spaces uh, for any time. Uh, here he had a problem, a portion of the airport uh, collapsed and uh, apparently he was not uh, accused, but there was a big turmoil and uh, apparently he said that, uh, you know, that the building was not quite built respecting uh, the, the specifications of the project, uh, of the project and, and so on. Um, I, you know, an, an airport is, I, I don't know now with the pandemic, and of course the pandemic is, is changing many things, you know, people will travel less, at least for the time being. But at that time, and he said that in the 60s, it was a new thing, a, a lot of airports, uh, came into being, so it was a high time for building airports, and he was lucky to work exactly in that field, and he didn't regret it, because, of course, uh, uh, you know, the rewards were, uh, um, you know, sometimes astonishing in, 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 in various ways, especially when you are allowed or were allowed to be as creative as he was. And, and again, we are talking about the major airport in Paris. So, uh, you know, a prestigious location. Even outside, you know, there are when looked from the highway, uh, you can tell, you know, it's uh, here is uh, someone who, who understands sculpture and sculptural, uh, uh, the sculptural side of architecture. Uh, this is the, the the top view. Now we see the Terminal Two from 1972 to uh, uh, sorry, uh, 1982. I I, uh, I wrote wrongly zero instead of nine. Uh, again in Paris, we'll also see a very interesting airport in Indonesia in Jakarta, and I like that work because I don't think it is easy. To, to make an airport that, that somehow connects with the local culture, but I think he succeeded. I didn't see that airport. I think we have here uh, two architects who actually live in Indonesia and uh, they probably landed on that airport. They know that airport. So I, I, yeah. I, would, I would welcome uh, your uh, in, intervention 
Florian and Daliana. But the pictures I saw, uh, uh, I liked, and I will arrive very soon there. But we are still in Paris for the moment. Uh, this is the Terminal 2, uh, modules A and B. I mean, they have many uh, so-called modules and terminals, just maybe not just, not just like in uh, New York, but still, it's a big airport. And again, we see that with structure, he does a lot because structure is not linear, it's not, uh, uh, it, it, it has a movement and maybe in, in, in such programs, it is enough. You don't need to add, uh, you know, ornaments because there is a certain uh, ornamental sensitivity because of this, uh, these curves that um, mysteriously recede, yet very logically at the same time. Now the airport, this is the airport I'm talking about. So uh, uh, Florian and, and Daliana or Daliana, if you want to say something about it, I, uh, you are much more entitled than me. Uh, so it, it was a work from uh, 45 years ago, uh, and this is just, uh, you know, the, 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 the plan. No, maybe not, but it looks like uh, kind of interesting. It almost looks like uh, this is the project, but it might be that it's actually a picture of it. Anyway, um, I, I, I love the fact that it's, it's the, the architectural language is, is very different is uh, more modest, almost traditional, but it's not a pastiche, it's not, a, it's not mimicking. Uh, uh, I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel he did, or they did a good, a good job here. What do you think, Florian and Daliana? Um, I, I totally agree. I mean, you see, like, what you see right now in the background here, this um, specific roof, um, is a traditional roof type. Um, which one exactly I can I can tell, but uh, maybe Daliana can. It's called Joglo, Joglo roof from Java. And um, yeah, what I find interesting is, uh, although it's a relatively big airport, um, it's um, with this low pitched roofs, which is uh, I would say, yeah, like like traditional Indonesian architecture to sort of shade this underway, so you don't have these roofs very high up, but more on a, on a human scale. Um, even though it's a, it's a big airport, um, it is not so imposing. You know, it's not so huge that you have like this massive central hall um, element. So it's sort of this uh, linear um, pitched roofs and then it branches out like a tree into this smaller um, joglo pavilions where you then step into the air, uh, airplane. So first of all, it, it, it works quite well. And second, um, yeah, it gives a, a surprisingly a human scale to an airport. I think you, you expressed very well, uh, uh, Florian, what my intuition was. Yes, I think this is a great quality, you know, to make a, a large uh, airport uh, uh, not, not imposing, almost with a certain uh, uh, intimacy and uh, almost domesticity and, and, and without uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, uh, sentimental. I, I think this is very difficult to do and I, I think he... Uh, uh, I think he and they, who the, the, the team that worked on this project, because he, obviously he didn't work alone. I, I think he did, they did a good job. And there are even, you know, so-called details, which are convincing uh, uh, in terms of being that, you know, uh, yeah. if we look at, at this. Even here, I see some kind of discreet and modern reference to the local culture. Uh, yes. And uh, in a, such a noble and simple way, if we are to compare with what he did with, uh, um, with the melodramas of Michael Graves, you know, I mean, here is an architect who understood that there is no room here for uh, melodramas and for postmodernism. Yes, there is a respect for the local culture, but I think very subtly he makes a reference to the local culture without uh, mimicking anything and without becoming, uh, you know, uh, ideologically charged, or I don't know how. Very, uh, yeah, but, uh, I like this work. About the ideology, I'm not entirely sure if I, if I can 100% agree. Um, because, I mean, um, Indonesia had this um, 
like a lot of other countries who got their independence, um, it is important for the nation building to also have their own icons and own representation of uh, what makes an Indonesian culture. And I would see this as a, a political project as well as, um, you know, what what uh, what happened in France on on the uh, um, uh, Sorry, what's the what's the former president? I forgot the name. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. But it is a nation building. So the, this airport is a very important airport. And it's a very important showpiece um, to uh, to the world of of what Indonesia stands for. However, I agree with you that it is um, sort of, it has its own ideas behind. It's not just a, a copy and, and a one to one implementation on a larger scale. So he worked on it, um, put his own thoughts into it. And I think this is, is quite good. And uh, in the beginning, when I came to this airport, I was a little bit um, puzzled. Do I really like it or not? And now they build another terminal, which is a sort of a very huge hall. And it's so bad that I actually start to understand uh, by seeing the bad example next to it how well this one is actually uh, i mean I, I want to say something it is really rare that indonesia gets a foreign architect to do um, public building so i i read just now and it is it, apparently there was a french and indonesian government uh, collaboration um, I don't know if it's fully funded by the French government or half funded. I mean, this is done during Suharto era, so the second president. Um, and it was, uh, so they use French architect for this. Uh, to be honest, I don't think this is a, a perfect uh, way of working with traditional architecture because I see that the Joglo roof uh, shown in the previous picture copied directly and uh, pasted it there i don't i think it requires more interpretation of uh, such um traditional roof i i do not like it that it is just pasted like that there but it's okay i mean it's an okay airport i'm very used to this airport um it won an aga khan award in 1995 yeah it's uh basically yeah it's fine it's all right but i don't think it's a great piece of architecture but uh, Daniana, when I look at this picture, without it's true, without knowing the specificities of, of, of the, the Indonesian culture, I see though a, a modern, uh, you know, architecture. Uh, even as a graphic work, if I would, if if I would have to, uh, you know, interpret it uh, just in terms of its um, qualities as a graphic work, to me this is uh, this is a I mean, I don't see anything folkish here. I see, I, I had an intuition that yes, it is connected with the local culture, but I also see a level of abstraction and of modernity. Uh, may, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but this is what I feel. And also here, yes, I see that, I feel that this is in, in Indonesia, but not in a crushing way. I think it's discreet. Yes, there is a, uh, and maybe you are, I mean, not maybe, you are more aware of certain things that I'm not because you are there. But, uh, uh, and I understand what Florian said, that uh, this was an important airport and that in an important moment in the development of the country and uh, accepting the independence. But if I think of other examples where in a nationalistic interest uh, that, you know, kind of uh, uh, unavoidable. This, I still think, is, uh, is rather discreet. And, and Florian himself said that it's, it's not imposing. Uh, anyway, you know it better because you have been there and you, you, uh, you used it probably at least several times. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but looking at the inconsistency of what Paul Andrew can do in his design, um, there is no consistency. It's more like a whore. I mean, in a way, he does anything that, uh, that is asked for. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure there is a consistency in his line of work, that he can do sometimes traditional architecture, sometimes a, a blob. It's, it's a bit uh, unclear for me. But of course, for the 
You said it's a bit what? Unclear. What direction is he going? I mean, what is his uh, red line in his, um, what's his consistency in architecture? I don't see it, except for he's doing airports and later concert halls. Well, you know, his consistency, uh, the only appreciable quality in one's life. I mean, uh, I, I, I have, I have great, uh, I know great uh, artists and architects who said that actually, uh, you know, uh, an oppressive form of consistency is a deficiency because you need uh, variety, I mean, multiplicity in unity. Yes, this was a work that was done in a special context, so he couldn't do what he did in China or at the Charles de Gaulle. Um, I'm not trying to defend him, I'm just trying to understand him. And, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I would have been uh, maybe a little bit disappointed to see that he, rep he repeated another Charles de Gaulle airport, you know, because it's a different culture, different time, a different society. It's, it's... Anyway, it was his attempt, and I think he's the only one. Unfortunately, I don't have other airports uh, to show because he built in a few other countries and I, I searched, but I, I, I couldn't find uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the time I had at my disposal uh, uh, the proper um, uh, images. Anyway, it, it's a subject to, to explore. Maybe you are disappointed by this um, kind of explicit, at least in this picture, reference to you know, the, the local culture. But then, what is the alternative to make uh, airports in such a way that uh, you don't know where you are, that the one in Japan looks like the one in uh, Rio de Janeiro and like the one in New York and like the one in Paris. On the other hand, myself, I'm a little bit reluctant to assume tradition in explicit uh, ways. I, I don't know, I, I don't know enough, neither about um, the conditions in which he worked uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe for you, it's a little bit uh, um, displeasing that uh, he was too accommodating, if I understood correctly what uh, Daliana wanted to say. Anyway. I mean, uh, one more thing, I find it quite interesting how our, our opinion is completely different here. Um, especially if you see like uh, me as being the foreigner and, and she being the actual the local person. So uh, actually, I never knew the opinion about this airport from her. So it's uh, quite good to hear. <laughs> yes. Thank no. you. We had to wait for the birthday of Paul Andre. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's interesting, and we can talk about this later also because uh, anyway, uh, it, it was an interesting dialogue, and, and and I will reflect on what both of you said. Okay, so we move forward. Um, now here he is almost like a shadow between two of his artworks. This was an exhibition I think he had in, uh, in China. The thing is, although he was described as being a painter, uh, uh, I, I, I couldn't find his paintings except uh, that um, self-portrait and this picture with two kind of interesting uh, graphic works or uh, artworks that he did there, but the picture is um, deficient a little bit. Anyway, we move forward. So, born in Bordeaux, France, Parisian architect Paul André had a great desire to do things with his hands and with his head and to always keep discovering something new. This is the last image uh, or slide of this um, presentation and we wish you, uh, we wish him um, happy birthday and I hope, uh, you know, uh, maybe in the future we'll discover new things about him. Okay, and now I will go, if you allow me to, to the uh, more uh, provocative architect who Jean Nouvel was and is, and we are talking personally, I think Jean Nouvel, um, I know I'm saying something uh, maybe unwarranted, but for me, Jean Nouvel is uh, uh, one of the most important architects in Europe and the world. Uh, maybe in Europe, maybe even uh, the most interesting at this point. I don't know. It's hard to, to establish such hierarchies. 
but he's continue, continue, continuously provoking himself and the others. And uh, today I added uh, the Doha uh, Museum that he built, uh, which the presentation I had already prepared for a year or uh, for one or two years uh, before, but that work was not um, included. So I included it today and I couldn't stop adding image, images because I think it's a, an interesting work. Okay, we start with Jean Nouvel. Now, I do believe that sometimes at least, Nomen est omen, the name is uh, destiny. And Nouvel, you know, means new. And uh, yes, he is the man of the new. Uh, his architecture is about newness, would say, um, or novelty, you know, would say uh, uh, Peter Eisenman, newness. He loved to do works like this, like two-ness or new-ness. Maybe you know, but Jean Nouvel, um, wanted to become a painter actually, but he was not received in the uh, Academy de, Beaux de, Beaux de Beaux-Arts, so he settled for architecture and he didn't look backwards. Okay, Jean Nouvel. Uh, now this is uh, one of the big success stories in architecture, uh, of course, um, even at the level of domestic life and will arrive there. Um, it's hard not to envy him because, uh, not because he moved now in a castle uh, at the Mediterranean Sea in the south of France, and he also keeps his office in Paris and is immensely, immensely, immensely successful. Uh, I, I think he was able and is able to negotiate with society and with life, kind of like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was able to, to you know, to, to take a, another example. Okay, Institut du Monde Arabe. Institut du Monde Arabe, which is an early work, not far away from Cathedral, uh, La Cathedral de Notre Dame. Now these are drawings, uh, the cat drawings, but we'll move past them. So it's on the other side of the Seine, uh, but uh, you can see Notre Dame from it, and you can see it from uh, the proximity of Notre Dame. Um, it's it, it's a good work and uh, yes it's uh, technological if you want but uh, again a reference to the arab culture is made uh, uh, maybe a little bit whimsically but uh, i think uh, correctly in a way and inside yes it is a me metallic architecture is a slick slick design uh, but it has also variety, and um, uh, it's interesting. He was, at that time at least, a uh, kind of a rationalist capable of second thoughts. And the second thought, if I can call it so, was uh, illustrated by the facade, where he played with, with this uh, uh, whimsical uh, apparatuses or gadgets almost that filter light automatically they, uh, the, the apertures, like in a camera, uh, open or close, uh, depending on the light you want in the, in the, in the building. Well, <laughs> apparently he squandered the money of the clients and continues to squander them because uh, these things do not work as intended and there are some difficulties and they cost a fortune. But they create this ornamental design that also has a function on the facade. Uh, and they are interesting. Uh, you get, again, you see here a modern architect trying to uh, respect or connect with a certain, you know, context. You know, uh, of course, the building is not in the Arab world, it's in Paris, but it is an institute of the Arab world. Uh, Institut du Monde Arabe. I think he did a good job, and uh, uh, you know the the building is still uh, you know it's not it's not, uh, it's not uh, passé. So this is one of his earlier works. Uh, he is excellent at this. You know he invents these mechanisms and then the, the minuteness of them and. Uh, uh, the ingenuity, you know, they, they, they are incredible and you actually see how they are made. They, they, 
I think I find them fascinating. I'm not good at this at all, but uh, this is irrelevant to our discussion. He is good uh, at this sort of thing. He has other problems, but not this one. So this is the facade, uh, the main facade of the of the building. You enter uh, through through uh, what is strange a little bit, and I had visited uh, this building. Is the first floor, and the ceiling has is very low, and it's it's a little bit uh, sadistic the way you are supposed to, uh, especially if you have a so-called classical uh, the training. Uh, uh, and you expect some kind of emphasis on the interest and uh, no, he, 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 you are kind of squeezed to enter, but uh, maybe he intended uh, that. Uh, interesting picture of that detail. Um, I forgot how it is called. I used to know, but I forgot in, uh, there is a name for this sort of uh, aperture, this opening in the uh, as a, I, I know it starts with letter M, but I don't know the whole word and I apologize. But he totally technologized it and, and, and made it a, a modern, although it is a, an ornament. It initially was uh, an ornament from the Arab culture. Interesting. It's just that they don't function very well. That's what I read. And the Arabs are protesting continuously that uh, they are ruined financially. Fortunately, they still have oil. Uh, so uh, they can pay for uh, for this uh, for this detail of um, of, uh, of the watchmaker, the Swiss watchmaker Jean Nouvel. Of course, he is not a, he was not he is not a watchmaker, but I think he has something of a watchmaker. You know, when you when you see uh, these the intricacies, the details, the minuteness, the, these mechanisms, he probably loves watches. Anyway, an interesting idea. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, appropriate, I think, for this, for this building. Now, we have an apartment building, uh, Las Boas, which was not built and very, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know very well how to describe it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's maybe a little kitsch, if not a little more than a little. Uh, it was not built, but uh, he is very adventurous. Jean Nouvel is adventurous. He surprises even himself uh, sometimes and will have the occasion to, to, to see this further. Uh, but it was not built, so it's just like, a, you know, a little uh, step forward. Now we arrive at a building that uh, together with the L'Institut du Monde Arabe made him famous. This uh, Neumosis apartment building in Nîmes, which was very, very good. Uh, I, I continue to like it. I mean, just compare the pathetic little houses on the left with this uh, social housing. It is a social housing. He used the industrial uh, uh, prefabricated elements to build it. And I think he did an excellent job. There are two courts uh, and, uh, and um, uh, it's interesting, you know. Uh, so you can bring in the new and 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 uh, in 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 almost provocative ways, using uh, as I said, uh, prefabricated industrial, uh, um, you know, um, elements that you can almost buy from uh, in, in, you know, the industry. There are such things. You assemble them almost as if you create some kind of uh, bricolage. And uh, look at the buildings. You know they. I don't know, they are new, they are very new, but somehow they belong to that place. I mean, they don't seem, seem to insult uh, whatever is around them, although they are very different. Um, this is what a good architect does, you know. Uh, you accept yourself, but you also have some, uh, you, are, you, you are not arrogant really. Uh, towards everybody and everything. And the, although Jean Nouvel, I think he's capable of a little bit of arrogance, but he's also, he can also be sweet. If, if I imagine, I don't know him personally. Uh, he's obviously seductive since he receives all these commissions. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this, uh, 
this uh, experiment is in, in uh, housing uh, is, is a valid one even today. What is a little bit uh, questionable here from what I read, and I don't know if I have images, uh, he, uh, there are some scribbles by certain artists in, in each apartment or in some apartments that he wouldn't have anyone touch. He, he, in, in that sense, he was a little bit tyrannical. You know, he, he wouldn't allow uh, the inhabitants, meaning the owners of the, these apartments, to touch the, you know, the little uh, ideograms or the scribblings on the walls directly on the concrete uh, uh, that, you know, maybe some of his friends did. But who knows, maybe uh, his, uh, uh, you know, request is not totally uh, illegitimate. But you see how interesting, I mean, who would think of, a, of an apartment building to look like this? And uh, he did it, it's built, it's not just grown. And people live there, as you can see. Uh, yeah, they even have a computer, the images, I guess, not all, well, it's an old computer, but... Uh, and you see the, the, the interior, which is uh, modern and maybe a little bit cold and rough, but when you bring in uh, furniture and, you know, uh, engravings and books and, uh, you know, uh, the things that uh, express our domestic life, the interior becomes more human. You see the, the, the artworks that I mentioned. He wouldn't allow this to, in any way to be, uh, you know, removed or, or changed. So the inhabitants had to live with these things. But it's kind of interesting, you know, these are uh, original ornaments that the building provided. I think it's very nice. It's, un it's unconventional. You know, uh, someone would say, well, you know, what kind of ornaments are these, you know, uh, a little graffitis in a way. Why not? Uh, uh, Jean Nouvel is a rebellious man, and, and I, I like his rebelliousness. He is able, though, his rebelli rebelliousness uh, doesn't irritate too much. As uh, Elizabeth Diller said, she said the trick in life and also in practicing architecture is to be outrageous, but not offensive. That's very difficult. I'm not so sure I am. I'm, I hear something. Uh, please turn off the microphone if you don't mind, unless you want to, to say something and we would welcome that. So what do you make of this, you know? The trick is, of course, we can comment on the word, the trick. I don't like this word, but she used it. The trick is to be outrageous, but not offensive. That's not easy at all. I know I failed many times. I was outrageous, but I was also offensive. But to be outrageous without being offensive, that's not easy. Okay. Uh, apartments make better places to work than offices. That's what Jean Nouvel said. Uh, probably, and he also said, and I don't have that quotation here, but I memorized it. He said, we should bring the office into the home and the home into the office. So I think his idea is valid, that when you humanize an office by bringing some kind, a certain level of domesticity and vice versa, you bring in in essence, it is about trying to unite work with play or with pleasure. Let's, in, let's associate home or domesticity with, with kind of pleasure, no? But to unite play with work is the most necessary and the most beautiful thing to do. And that's exactly what we do not do. It's as if we are doomed, because if we are trying to unite the two, our lives would be, I think, much richer and much more creative. In my uh, attempt to be outrageous and maybe offensive as well, I would say we should abolish the weekends. Because if we abolish the weekends, we will bring in the working days, the excitement, the playfulness of the weekends. We would have to, because otherwise when to do it. And if we, if we bring in the playfulness of the weekends in the working days, that would mean that our work would become pleasurable. And, 
and uh, I would even eliminate vacations. I totally agree with uh, Philip Johnson in this case uh, when he said, I hate vacations. I hate them too. What are they good at? To just lay in the sun and like a vegetable and do nothing? When, as he put it, you know, I can build a skyscraper or a building. Well, an architect in a vacation or a student could continue to develop in architecture, but, but it's immensely important to do it also playfully, meaning in an enjoyable way, not like a task that the school asks us to do, asks, asks you to do, not, not like some, some, some obligation, but to work with pleasure, to play. So in that sense, yes, to bring the office at home and the home into the office, I think it's, it's liberating. Hey, seductive Frenchman. Ay, ay, ay. Anyway, Paris Philharmonia, a building I saw last year. And uh, yes, it is cold. Yes, it is metallic. But it is a, an interesting intervention in Paris. And yes, he had troubles, big uh, uh, loss uh, uh, problems. I mean, uh, he was sued. Uh, uh, the city of Paris had troubles with the Jean Nouvel and Jean Nouvel with the city of Paris. But look what he did. And you know, you say, why, 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 why do it so dramatically? Why, uh, why this decorative skin, this ornamental skin? Uh, why not? I have been there. It's very close to Parc de la Villette, uh, near Bernard Chumis' work. And uh, yes, it's grayish, it's gray, it's cold, it's metallic but also has some kind of insinuations of the flight of the birds. Look at the, the ornaments that, that are, uh, uh, you know, exquisite and, and, and complicated. And uh, um, I think it's a good work. Yes, it is a little bit uh, emphatic, but, but this is Paris after all, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a city that, uh, you know, I think it loves provocation. Although from another point of view, it's probably a kind of a conformist city. I know I'm saying something controversial, but uh, I think it's true about Paris and Parisians. Yet they build something like this uh, and they invest Jean Nouvel with, uh, with uh, I guess with some kind of uh, desire for novelty. And they got the right man for it. Of course, um, I don't know if I have enough great pictures. I should look at night. I mean, if you search, uh, I want to say it again. These presentations that I make, that, that I, I try to make, are just, are just invitations for you to continue to explore. And anyone can do this now at home very easily. Because on the internet, you find everything. And that's where I found these things too, although I took some pictures there, but I, I don't know where I put them. It's an interesting architectural animal, you know, how else to describe it, you know, and I see people on the, on the, on the roof, you know, uh, uh, it's, um, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting building. Inside seems quite comfortable and, you know, um, you know, it's not really such a big difference between what he did and uh, what uh, Paul Andre did. Uh, and it's not possible really at the inside, but the outside, well, the difference between the, the, the operas and the theaters and the performing arts centers that uh, Andre built and uh, Nouvelle did is here that, is, is that here um, the spaces are filled with people, but there they could be filled with people as well. Uh, look, there are very interesting uh, things to be seen in this building. When I visited it, I couldn't enter, but um, maybe the next time if the pandemic allows us. Even during construction is interesting. And this is an idea I always had, that a good be an interesting building is interesting at all stages of, of, of its uh, uh, growing up or coming into being. Yeah. Even if uh, there is disorder or I don't know what, it's still kind of stimulative and interesting. And I think this idea to, to decorate it in this way is, uh, is, uh, is nice. Of course, people worked. 
they work manually to assemble these uh, fragments that are all different and you see they even have different colors and but but it is said again and again that ornament is coming back to architecture and it is very obvious people are not happy any longer just with structure they also need some kind of softening of the structure uh, through some kind of ornamentation either indirect or direct uh, uh, or oblique and uh, this brings a sensitivity almost an impressionistic uh, uh, sensitivity to the building which otherwise would have been maybe unbearably cold and look at the look at this uh, this profile that, that they created in his office you know uh, it's some kind of a bird I think abstracted and uh, assembled uh, in a certain way you almost have the feeling that the building somehow accommodates some kind of abstracted image of the sky with a um, you know birds flying on, 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 on it here is the <laughs> the lawyer Jean Nouvel defending his uh, his project I'm sure he's an excellent salesperson an architect has to be a good salesperson because it doesn't matter how good is the project but if you don't know how to defend it you might lose it and someone with a less good project can uh, can get it so here he is uh, you know uh, seductive with the Zaha Hadid they were probably friends um, yeah the meeting between uh, star architects why not uh, Okay, but I, I, I do like, I come back to this, the fact that he went up a little, his building through this, uh, uh, you know, capricious uh, ornamentation. I, I, I feel tempted to talk about something that referred to art, to painting in the 19th century, that is impressionistic architecture. I don't know if um, someone wrote already a book about it, but I think it's an interesting subject, you know, and maybe we could even do a presentation, so to speak, about it, impressionistic architecture. And I even welcome participation. I invite participation. Let's reflect on how we can uh, bring some sensitivity to our buildings, maybe uh, kind of uh, inspired by pointillist painting or impressionistic and post-impressionistic painting, because what I see here, these ornaments uh, have kind of that effect uh, of, uh, of uh, suggesting the possibility of an impressionistic uh, building, if I can call it so. Uh, otherwise, uh, of course, the, the, the vigor of the, of the volumes and the uh, geometry is not really impressionistic, but the ornamentation uh, has a little bit of that effect. May I ask? Pardon? May I ask or add something? Please. Because actually, you know, now you arrive in a very interesting image because you know it has this stark contrast between the outer polygonal shape, uh, which is made up by the tessellation of these birds, almost like Escher, and then these sort of squeezed in organically. Um, almost this swirl-like structure being squeezed in, which is then a, a reflected, reflective uh, chrome, almost woven. So it would be very interesting to understand why he sort of made this um, almost two opposing elements of this inner animal and, 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 and the outer one, you know, the, the soft and then the, the hard shell around it. Yes. Well, what we see here on the on the right side uh, is very similar. Uh, the color is not similar, but to the pavilion built by Daniel Lipskin for China in Milan, uh, the so-called architectural dragon. Dragon. Um, so there are certain themes also having to do with the time, even with fashion in a way. But you have very distinct architectures actually, and here you see two different kinds of. Uh, of uh, ornamenting in a way the building on the left and on the right besides the uh, the tensions that uh, Florian mentioned but look how rich it is actually the building and unexpected 
you know, uh, uh, yes, it is metallic, uh, yes, it is cold, but because of this vibration of the facade, this impression is, so to speak, of the facade, uh, uh, is, uh, is alive. Yes, you are dreaming about Mr. Novell and you built it. The inside is a different story. Uh, 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 no. Anyway. Now, of course, you could ask all the drama there, what is its function, actually, you know, but uh, such capricious uh, architectural uh, parts of, uh, you know, architectural uh, um, constructs, or I don't know how to call them, are present in the work of other, um, you know, uh, much talked about architects. Uh, there is a, a certain level of uh, frivolousness or, uh, you know, the functionalist might be irritated, but, but there are also functions that are uh, in a different way uh, functional, you know. Uh, I'm not trying to defend here squandering millions of euros for nothing, but, uh, you know, uh, the sculptural side of architecture is also uh, something that is needed, you know, and uh, that's, that's what he chose to do. Anyway, um, yes, 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 you are handsome and we can tell your eyes are, uh, you know, uh, romantically contemplating a horizon uh, that is, um, maybe has even some melancholia in it. I like his head. Finally, you'll have an occasion to, and uh, now I should not anticipate, uh, Louvre, Abu Dhabi. Now in Abu Dhabi, I think he did a good job with the exception in my opinion, that he chose for this. You see the relationship with uh, L'Institut du Monde Arabe, but here he used this cupola quite large, and I, I personally think that uh, if it wasn't so centralized and so perfect and so round, it would have been better. But maybe, uh, look, it's really, you have, again, uh, two systems here. Underneath the bazaar and above, uh, the, the unifying and almost uh, uh, imperialistic uh, cupola, you know, it's, th th this cupola is, uh, re represents probably uh, his, uh, you know, French, French upbringing, you know, the, the French still have, uh, uh, you know, a, a form of, uh, they, they, they still like centralized power, although they are the ones who brought into the world Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, but they have a strong uh, history of, um, uh, you know, uh, kings and, and, and emperors and uh, Louis Le Soleil and uh, all the, um, the major uh, roads lead to L'Arc de Triomphe. So there is a, a centripetal culture, which you can see even in Jean Nouvel here, but this is uh, Abu Dhabi, you know, it's, it's not in France, it's not in Paris. So I, I am a little bit bothered. Yes, he tried to bring impressionism, uh, so to speak, in that cupola because of the filtering of the light and that is positive. But why did he use such a, you know, kind of dogmatic, will, will, and willful uh, shape? I actually think it's, it, it, it's problematic. This is my opinion. It's like a hat, but uh, the, 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 the cover of a pot, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, suppressing the, the variety and the life of the so-called bazaar underneath. It's almost as if I am to speculate now, and I don't know how inspired I am. This is the gesture of the colonist. You have the colonized expressing themselves through the bazaar, through the scattered little uh, structures and buildings. And then you have the Roman or the colonist, you could name that colonist as you wish, coming with his um, uh, cover, covering the pot of the boiling life of the local culture. And uh, it bothers me. But anyway, the light is good uh, inside. I think uh, this attempt at uh, uh, bringing impression is through light into the building is noble and it works. I just had questions about that, um, that form uh, outside. Inside maybe you don't uh, succeed in seeing it. What, what is here actually? It's an embroidery. 
it's an architectural embroidery uh, and uh, and uh, i think uh, um, the, the embroidery is coming back to architecture in uh, very interesting ways because technology is allowing us to do this and of course uh, scripting and programming and pa parametry allow us to do things that in the past would have been very difficult if not impossible Anyway, this is the building in Abu Dhabi, uh, a big uh, project with a big budget. Now that, but, uh, and he didn't stop because he did it. You see, it's, 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 it, this is almost, I think it's called Mille. My mother used to embroider such thing or crochet them. I, I, I'm not sure about the word, but uh, we used to put this, you know, under a plate or on the table or under, uh, you know, uh, glass or something or in the center for several people well he did it in architecture he covered the louvre in abu dhabi with something like this um, again and again we see the architect as an adventure someone who takes risks sometimes the risks are worth taking other times less so but if you don't take risks uh, the risk is that you'll create something uh, maybe less uh, less relevant. Or... Anyway, okay. I, I don't th I don't think this is one of his uh, very best works. Although inside uh, it has some qualities, and uh, <laughs> the client seems happy, and the architect is happy. And who said that life is difficult and with problems? Certainly. Uh, you cannot say that looking at Jean Nouvel and not looking at, at the client. They are both happy. And when they are both happy, even the flowers smile. I don't know how happy though the workers were because you can see they had to handle a very, a very complex uh, web here, you know. <laughs> but they were probably well paid. We, uh, they were, we are talking about Abu Dhabi and uh, skillful workers. Plus, just like in the Middle Ages, this forced them to also uh, confront the unknown. Uh, and, 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 and this puts one in the position to be creative. You have to be. The discomfort creates the conditions for creativity. So I think that in, uh, when the work was done, the workers were happy too, because they struggled, but they did something that was so-called uncommon. And as you can see, they worked at this architectural embroidery of, of quite a large scale and, uh, and very complex, this mesh. And you can see it's, uh, it's unbelievable. People walk on it as if it, it is a hill and not the smallest hill in the world. <laughs> nice. And what is inside is even nicer. He literally made a roof that is a curtain that filters the light and is an embroidered curtain, not one of these, you know, shower curtains or, uh, you know, banal modern curtains. No, it is an embroidered cur curtain. I mean, look just at one segment, how big it is. God, you know. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, you are. You are. <laughs> you made it. Now, Tour Icon in Lyon. Uh, which was uh, uh, not built yet, or it was built, but when I made the presentation, it was not yet. It's kind of interesting to compare this. Actually, it was built because I have been last year in Lyon. I didn't come close to it, unfortunately, but I think it was built uh, to compare it with a building kind of similar a little bit by So Fujimoto. Um, anyway, this is just the project, uh, sorry. Icon, La Confluence by Jean Nouvel. It is in the area of, of uh, La Confluence in Lyon, where there is also the Le Musée de Confluence par, uh, by uh, um, Kopp Himmelblau. And um, <laughs> yes. So, Voici la future, toute à la Confluence. Um, yes, these are the real estate offices uh, selling the apartments there for. Uh, I imagine the appreciable amounts of money. There is also the Cube Orange by a very interesting architecture group called uh, Jacobs and McFarlane. And I recommend, I suggest to you to, if you want to take a look at their works, especially the, the Orange Cube, but they have a few other works. 
I had the occasion to interview one hour and a half through Skype. At that time, uh, Zoom didn't exist. Um, the, the partner of this firm, uh, McFarlane, um, he met his wife, Jacob, uh, at Cyark in Los Angeles. Okay, one Central Park, Sydney, another extravaganza by uh, Jean Nouvel. I mean, just, just look at those immense uh, surfaces that uh, float there just to reflect light. He said that that was the reason he built them, but uh, I don't know. Uh, there is some perversity here, I think. As equally, there is some perversity about these uh, so-called vertical gardens. He collaborated with um, a famous um, French, uh, I don't know how to call him, horticulturalist or, or uh, artist working with uh, vegetable material, but uh, Beyond uh, these uh, observations is still a provocative building, particularly because of those uh, uh, strange additions at the top of the building that are meant to reflect apparently to uh, light into the courtyard at the bottom that otherwise wouldn't receive sunlight. But what a, what a, you know, uh, an effort to do something that maybe it could have been done easier. Personally, I think there is a certain level of cynicism sometimes in Jean Nouvel, but he's able uh, most of the time to balance that cynicism with a certain amount of innocence. And as Friedrich Nietzsche said, this is always good to do, that to have both kind of you know, uh, cynicism and innocence simultaneously. Sometimes I think he's a little bit more cynical than innocent, but uh, this maybe makes him even more appealing or interesting to prospective clients. Um, that, yeah, this is the man, Patrick Blanc, uh, that, that he collaborated with, creates world's tallest vertical garden for Jean Nouvel Sydney Tower. I don't know if it's still uh, the, the tallest uh, vertical garden. And uh, the very idea to me seems to be a little forced. But uh, what can we do? You know, we cut down uh, trees and we killed nature in order to build uh, uh, large cities. And now we try to bring back nature somehow. In New York, there was a project to transform the whole Broadway into a park. Because yes, we miss nature, we miss the green, we miss the fresher air. And now in exasperation, what do we do? We create these uh, natural rugs so to speak, we hang them on the facades of the buildings. Yeah, uh, they, it's a little bit, uh, to me, uh, you know, problematic, but, but I understand the, the, the reason, because uh, if we cannot uh, uh, use, uh, if we cannot bring back nature horizontally, because there is no room any longer in our cities, we hang it vertically and we torture, you know, uh, the plants to grow horizontally uh, from a vertical plane. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the age of the Anthropocene. We are not yet in post-Anthropocene, but we might move towards that time with great speed now. Okay, so um, this is another building. Uh, again, I, I, I wouldn't give him a 10 or an, uh, an A for this building, but who cares if I wouldn't give him a 10 or an A, nobody and certainly not him. Uh, again, I, I, you know, when you think about the limited resources of the world, the troubles we have, the crisis we have, we talk about sustainability and climate change and all the rest. And here you have the exhibitionism, uh, uh, you know, the acrobatics of Jean Nouvel that are a little bit, uh, of course he built this um, uh, some years ago, so, you know, uh, he has some excuse in a way, but yeah, uh, I move forward. In the age of opulence and uh, unending optimism, I guess it's possible something like this too, but we are now in a different time. You know, the pandemic is uh, making us reconsider some things and so is the climate change. I like though the renderings, you know, again, talking about impressionism in architecture. 
you have this uh, this uh, attempt at softening and uh, problematizing architecture through vegetation in this case uh, and the uh, renderings are more appealing actually than um, you know the actual result anyway yeah you see on the left why he built that thing you see the schematic the diagrams of uh, the sun uh, rays hitting uh, uh, the bottom of those um, um, cantilevered uh, platforms and then directing the sunlight uh, on the lower levels you know a very uh, you know uh, contrived and 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 uh, the, you know yes forced way of um, doing something that could could have been done in simpler ways, I think. Anyway, yes, but if it was done in simpler ways, it would not have looked spectacular. Let us not forget, we live at a time that is still seduced, uh, seducible by spectacles and by scandals, even visual or otherwise. We love scandals, we love publicity. The media is nourished by scandals and publicity. So we need. Uh, uh, to be excited continuously, you know, to be stirred up. Uh, anyway, Serpentine Gallery, he did himself a Serpentine Gallery, of course, uh, and as opposed to some others, he was um, in a way more uh, uh, simple in a way, but the color is not simple and he was right. He knew very well what Goethe also knew that green loves red because both colors love harmonic through contrast. Maybe you know and you can verify. And this is very interesting that it was actually a poet, not a scientist, but a poet with a scientific uh, interest. I'm talking about Goethe. Goethe, in his uh, attempt to prove Newton wrong, because he accused Newton, he, he used to tell Newton, Newton, you try to make the same mistake that the church does to divide God into three or four, you divide light into six or seven. So it was Goethe who discovered that if you look at a red spot, an intense red spot, and then you move your eyes towards a white wall, you will see green. This is very, very interesting because there is no green there. How come you see the opposite color of the one you looked at? So it seems there is some kind of uh, the mechanism of, of nature and of life works with opposites and it's the same with yellow or, 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 or orange and blue. You look uh, at one color that is, um, you know, uh, clearly defined and, uh, you know, strongly asserted and then you move your eyes on a white wall or a white surface, you see the opposite color, uh, the same shape. This is very interesting. So Jean Nouvel understood that the greenery of the park uh, is uh, kind of uh, excited to see some redness. So his building is totally red. And he didn't really need to do a very spectacular building because what he did is not really spectacular, but it's red. And because it is red in tension with the green of the park, uh, create some kind of uh, dynamic duo. Um, yeah. So, this is Jean Nouvel. We have seen other serpentine galleries over the years. All is red, of course. But look how meaningful the greenery of the park and of the trees is seen from, from the interior of the, of the red womb geometrical um, if I can call it so, probably not, I don't know if I say, anyway, it's still Genouvel, yes, that's him, uh, he likes slickness, he likes uh, chromatic provocations, he likes a little bit of cynicism, and he likes uh, that red pillow or whatever it is, mat the small mattress, uh, inflatable probably on the, on the grass. Now, the Cypress Tower has plants bursting through its walls. Now here we see different kinds of uh, tensions between nature and architecture in Cyprus. Uh, he is the man of the day. There is a level of, you know, 
fashionability and uh, opportunism in Jean Nouvel, it has to be because uh, the level of his success, it would be almost inconceivable. Otherwise, yes, nature informally uh, tries to escape the squeezing the architect forced it into. And uh, there are these, uh, you know, uh, accidents on the facades, the green accidents, where you have uh, the impulses of nature forcing, forcing the, the white facade to open up a little bit in, in some ac uh, accents. Uh, and, 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 and in a way, again, his nonconformism or his rebelliousness is now shown in his association with, with um, the attempts nature makes to, <laughs> to break through the architecture. Uh, you know, now the MoMA Tower in uh, New York City, and uh, I'm, I'm happy this building uh, is built, and I don't know if, if it's completed. I, it might be. When I prepared this presentation, it was in the process of becoming, uh, being built after more than 10 years when the construction was postponed. He didn't have all the signatures or all the funds were not there. I don't know, but it's a Gothic, modern building and i think as such is a good addition to the skyline of, uh, of uh, manhattan uh, uh, it's very interesting that this i call it kind of a gothic or neo-gothic or modern gothic skyscraper by jean came from jean nouvel because i i never expected really uh, gothic scenes from jean nouvel but in this tower i think he is and I like the structures, even the, you know, the skeleton is, uh, is, is interesting. And it's interesting because of the diagonal uh, uh, embroideries, so to speak. So, so the structure is structure all right, but it's also a little bit ornamental, at least for someone who doesn't know a lot about structures. But I think the structure could have been done in a more, uh, less uh, ornamental way. He chose to do it in this way, and I think he chose correctly. So you see, his building stands out. That's his building, uh, as opposed to the other buildings which are not his. Uh, now, I don't know if you know this building. Uh, uh, it was not done by, by him. It was not done by Jean Nouvel, but it's kind of similar a little bit to the, the silhouette. Um, and this is the top view of this skyscraper. This is another view. Uh, again, this was not done by Jean Nouvel. Another view of the same uh, possible skyscraper, which was not built. And another one. And this is Jean Nouvel. So what you saw before was not done by Jean Nouvel. It was done by the one who talks to you now. Playing with Archicad. <laughs> because that's all I can do it will never become a building. So it, it, it is just what you saw, uh, some sketched uh, tower. But I thought there was some kind of similarity here. And then you'll see another, maybe I am uh, some kind of living uh, vicariously through Jean Nouvel or in his shadow, because you'll see another example of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, both immodestly and maybe excessively modestly placing me uh, myself into some kind of, uh, association with him, oblique as it is. You'll understand what I'm talking about very soon. Anyway, this is the tower uh, that is part of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a museum which continues to challenge itself and us with its uh, commitment to uh, aesthetical provocations. Uh, on the right, uh, we see <laughs> out of focus Chrysler building, and on the left, of course, a detail of um, the tower by uh, Jean Nouvel. Recently, the museum opened the part that was re-envisioned uh, by uh, dealer Scofidio and Renfro, that, uh, that uh, very Elizabeth dealer I mentioned uh, saying, uh, the trick is to be outrageous, but not offensive. Some people have this skill. I, I, I don't have it, unfortunately. I'm always, uh, always offensive when I, when I try to be outrageous. Um, okay. 
move forward. They, they had a long saga, this building, but it's now done. Um, and again, I like the spider like, uh, you know, uh, spider's web, the, the structure, because it is embroidered, yes, a little bit capricious, I think. But it's okay. The architect is still a little bit um, melancholy, <laughs> although he had no reasons to. Um, with considering his success. Now an apartment building at 100 uh, and across the street is one by um, Frank Gehry, but Nouvelle's building is much better than the one by Frank Gehry. I have shown this one a few days ago here on Zoom. I think it's a good building, this, this bricolage of windows. Uh, but again, we are, we, he creates a, an embroidered curtain and he embroidered here, the, 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 the em, 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 embroidering is actually a, a collage of windows of various uh, configurations and sizes and so on. This is the, this is the side of, 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 of Nouvelle that sabotages uh, uh, centrality and uh, 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 direct architectural discourse that is exclusively centralized and rational and logical. So uh, he, he uses a certain level of ambiguity uh, in his architecture. And I think this adds some quality uh, to his work. Although, of course, it also adds uh, uh, some problems and complications, but uh, life is uh, like this itself, isn't it? Anyway. The Copenhagen Concert Hall, he did uh, this building in Copenhagen, which is very different from what we see before, we saw before. But this only shows that he has a very large, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll probably now be silent for 20 minutes to find the word, so I better change the phrasing. Yeah, he has a uh, vocabulary, if I can say so, that. Uh, allows for different kinds of architecture to come into being. No more embroidery here, although there is some impressionist because of the, the projections on, on that wall uh, or, or on those walls, but of a very different kind than what we saw in, in, in the previous building. The interior, you know, uh, is uh, an interior, uh, but this is a, a cubical magical box that um, displays on its facades, uh, you know, uh, what it wants to display and why not? It works. Then this building, you probably know, it was built uh, a longer time ago in Switzerland. Um, uh, he loves these uh, large canopies, you know, these cantilevered uh, surfaces, uh, the longer and the wider, the better. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I, I can see him. I, I see this building and I see him. I even see his face somehow. I, I don't know very well why. Uh, I, I, I do believe that an interesting subject to think about is architecture as self portraiture because, willingly or not, architecture like other arts to an extent at least, uh, represent uh, the portraits, the self-portraits of, of uh, its authors or author. An interesting subject too would be his dialogue with the vertical. Well, if I am to express myself in a, you know, maybe not sufficiently modern way, I would say his um, his metaphysical relationship with um, with, with with the above. But um, I, I believe he's rather atheistic. But who knows? Anyway, the Dubai Opera, very interesting project, but it was not built. He's probably most surrealist proposal at least, and it's sad it was not built, but I like it. The little I see and the little I understand, in fact, I understand almost nothing, 
That's why perhaps I like it. And look, <laughs> this was supposed to be the building. And again, we are dealing with an architect who takes risks. Now, of course, because we mentioned Elizabeth Diller and Scopidio, they built, and you probably know that uh, foggy building in Switzerland, uh, where the building was just uh, a fog and you were advancing towards a cloud, a foggy cloud, if I can say so. And there was a structure there. I forgot exactly how it, is, it was called. Here also, he seems to uh, play with this idea of a building that dissolves itself. Again, you know, it's about the impression is attacking, in a way, uh, uh, the building. Uh, and look again, another funambulesque picture uh, uh, at night. You know, you don't know very well what's going on there, but it's, it's inciting and it's mysterious and interesting. Anyway, it was not built and it will not be built. Further study is necessary to understand what's going on. This we do understand because we have seen this sort of thing from him, from L'Institut du Monde Arabe to the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. Uh, here we are beginning to understand it's not so complicated, but the picture is not serving us very well, and I apologize. Uh, he loves cupolas, he loves, he is a Frenchman, he probably admired Napoleon. We saw this picture, we saw this one, but not so up close and not uh, looking towards, uh, <laughs> towards the divine. Now, here we see. Uh, the, the worst dressed architect in the world, uh, that is Renzo Piano on the left. Then we see Mr. Nouvel with his young wife, his third wife, of course. And uh, um, I don't know, maybe on the right is Renzo Piano's uh, uh, wife. I don't know who she is. Here is again Jean Nouvel with, uh, with his uh, um, wife. Uh, and uh, these architects can only be envied. They will probably live all over 100 because they have very young wives. Jean, uh, Stephen Hall also became fa the father for the first time at 72. Uh, and now he's a father again at 75. Can you believe it? And uh, <laughs> his wife is at least 45 years younger than him, if not 50. But, you know, architects love beauty and youthfulness, and this keeps them young. Even Kenneth Frampton uh, wrote me an email that uh, he is now, uh, he will be 90 this year. And he, not that he blamed the word, is not appropriate, but he explained that maybe a role in this was the fact that his, uh, uh, um, about 25 years younger than him, she was his student. And now, of course, uh, <laughs> The time passes by and she is 90 and she is not so young any longer. Anyway, this is Jean Nouvel. I think he even had a, my feeling is because I saw a picture of him, truly I have a feeling he had a, a, a cosmetic surgery because he looked, he actually began to look oriental. He looked either Chinese or Japanese, not so much in this picture, but I saw a picture, I would have been convinced this is a, a man from either you know, China or, or, or Japan or Korea. Anyway, here they are again, <laughs> the Mephistophelic look of, uh, of, uh, of, of the great architect. Yes, you are doing well, Mr. Nouvel. Uh, we agree. Yes, we agree. Do you know who this gentleman is? <laughs> now you finally have a chance to see me. This is me. <laughs> Or in in a in a hypo in a in a in a some kind of a, you know uh, symmetrical uh, longed for. I was just uh, making fun of myself because he has a hat here and I have a hat. But this was a few years ago, and I know the, I don't like to show this picture because it is a little bit contrived. Anyway. Here you have Renzo Piano, and in the middle is a famous designer whose name I do not know. <laughs> and on the right, now please tell me, am I wrong? How could an architect of the uh, stature and success, and uh, he's also Italian, like Renzo Piano, dress so badly? It's beyond me, unless he does it intentionally. I mean, most architects who want to, to be, you know, cool, they dress in black. 
because blackness always saves you, saves your day. Like the designer, like Jean Nouvel. But look at Lorenzo Piano. It's uh, like he ignores all the requirements of the day. What is wrong, Renzo? I mean, you are Italian. Italians are notorious for dressing very well. Where is the, the color co coordination? How could you put that sweater on you, for God's sake? You know, <laughs> anyway, here's Renzo Piano, Pritzker Prize winner. On the right, also Pritzker Prize winner. And maybe in the center is, uh, uh, what's his name? Anyway, I wanted to make a joke, but uh, I didn't succeed. <laughs> uh, here he is. We are dealing with Napoleon here, without doubt. This is Napoleon after he won the battle. Uh, and look at, at the scarf. He's covering his, uh, of course, the wind was blowing. The wind of victory was blowing in a certain way. Here he is with each Meyer on the right. Um, <laughs> now, you tell me. Those shoes are, uh, I mean, uh, where are the shoes of Jean Nouvel here? Here we have some famous people, I, I have to tell you. They are all Pritzker Price laureates. So, uh, do you know whose shoes are those? Uh, uh, whose shoes are uh, the ones on the left? And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Anyway, I, I know you, you cannot tell, I couldn't either, but you'll see very soon whose shoes we are talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, on the left, Christian de Porzon Park. The following from left to right, Wang Shu. Then in the center, the worst dressed architect in the world, Renzo Piano. Then Aravena and then Jean Nouvel. What five, uh, the five knights of the Pritzker uh, order. <laughs> yes, you have all the reasons to be happy. Of course, Aravena is a little bit ignoring the, the etiquette of, and maybe even Jean Nouvel. Look, his uh, collar is up like a rebellious uh, teenager. Why not? The only one who is, well, not really. The Christian de Porzon Park and Wang Shu are, uh, you know, kind of decent and, you know, uh, uh, at least Wang Shu is dressed for the occasion. But Christian de Porzon Park is still a little bit unacceptably casual, in my opinion. Anyway. One new change building in London. Uh, this is a big, big, big uh, department store. He built one also in Berlin, uh, Lafayette Galleries. This is a building that uh, 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 is, 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 uh, is, um, has that opening in order to align it with, uh, with uh, St. Paul Cathedral. So it's some kind of an homage to the cathedral by Christopher Wren. Um, Yes, uh, Jean Nouvel, uh, despite, I'm joking now, his metaphysical concerns, he also builds department stores and uh, quite large and quite in the middle of, of, of London. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, if you build just one such building all your life and you are set for life financially and otherwise, of course. Anyway. Uh, Don. Yes. This building is very near to where I live, so I kind of visit the building quite frequently. And if I may say, it is, it, it is pretty successful building in the way that people kind of like it and visit it. And um, is, it has got a very good flow of the space. So it, it is very interesting and in, in the way that it kind of sits on the streets on the corn, corner of two streets and it does address the cathedral and the lift are the two uh, glass lifts that as you go in to go up to the roof level which is a um, roof garden with cafe, bar and restaurants. Uh, the, the glass leaf gives you, as you kind of elevating, it gives you a very good feeling in regards to you're all also moving on the facade of the St. Paul's. So it, it, it does play a very interesting game in that. So I thought I should share that with you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Azar. Uh, and if you want to say something else, please do so. 
um, yeah, I, I have this feeling it is a successful building. And uh, you see now in the, in the diagrammatic site plan that he didn't ignore St. Paul Cathedral. And uh, in, in this sense, he was a, a wise contextualist. You know, it, it, it is an homage to the work of Christopher, Sir, Sir Christopher Wren, and uh, I think he, he, he chose correctly. Yes, I, I agree. It is a good building, I like. You know, if I'm allowed to speculate or to, to uh, yeah, in a way to speculate, I, I, I could say here that here you have a commercial building, uh, very mundane and, and, and very successful in the center of a very important, uh, you know, contemporary city and, and, and spirit is breaking commerce in a way uh, is breaking it but but through this breaking actually both earn something uh, the cathedral earns recognition and the department store earns the dialectics of being more than just commerce so yes he chose correctly um, I, I think he was very inspired uh, to do so to do what he did No, no, Nouvelle is a complex uh, architect, and uh, that's why I think he's, uh, uh, he's superior to uh, Port Sam Park, and maybe also superior a little bit, although I shouldn't say this, I, I, I don't like hierarchies, but I, 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 Nouvelle is, 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 is a worthy architect. Okay, here you see, you know, that, uh, when you exit the building, you see the cathedral. And um, it, it is a, a relationship that uh, he didn't ignore. And uh, he did the right thing, yes. I just thought of it, Azar, if you want, if you have the time and the interest, maybe one day, if you are, um, uh, you know, uh, so kind, maybe you could uh, transmit something from, from, from London or make yourself a presentation about London, about things that maybe from, you know, uh, you know personal uh, uh, impressions and buildings that are less known or anything would be very nice to to hear, uh, you know, someone who lives in London uh, contribute with a material that is, uh, you know, uh, difficult to find in, in magazines or in, on the internet and so on. Yes, of course. Um, I am, as I've already said, I'm in the middle of moving, etc. But within the next week or so, I will have a little bit more time and I will put some probably PowerPoint together and make a presentation. Or if I have your email address, I will send information and pictures to you as well. So there, there, there is a lot of information available here. So and I just have to go to my kind of archives and, and send them over if, if you would like. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. Or you, you, or you could film your, your, your uh, move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the move is, is, is a big headache, but it will be finished. In I week. know, all, 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 uh, all uh, moves are headaches. Yeah. Look yeah. at his initial sketch. That's lovely, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. And you see here the sacred and the profane, to use the title of a book by uh, Mircea Eliade, which I saw many years ago on a shelf in the studio of um, Stephen Hall. 
the sacred and the profane in the sketch of uh, Jean Nouvel. You see, there is nothing else. This is what interest, interested him the most. And in a way, again, he, he chose correctly. Uh, okay, now you see his building from the top of uh, St. Paul. Christopher, Sir Christopher Wren himself was, a, was an incredible architect who was actually not an architect. You know, he was a, a physicist and, uh, you know, apparently Newton uh, appreciated him a lot. And uh, he had other, he was a polymath, but not an architect. But at that time, anyone could have practiced architecture, a gentleman. It was a gentleman's occupation. If you had people who believed in you and commissioned you, you could have built. Not so any longer. Anyway, uh, cutting the ribbon. Hey, the young uh, architect rejected by the Bazaar, <laughs> but he did it uh, nevertheless. At that time, when so he was young here, but at that time he was friends with an architect. Maybe you you are not so familiar with with Claude Parron. And maybe one day, I mean, one day we'll talk about Claude Parot. I have already a presentation on him. Although in the case of uh, Michael Grace, for example, I was wrong. I, I, I thought I had one, but I couldn't find it. And uh, so I had to create a new one with big headaches and not sleeping. Anyway, an interesting man. Do you know who this one is, though? Because this is not, uh, obviously, it's not Jean Nouvel. Okay, if you don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll allow myself to tell you. It's Frank Gehry, <laughs> young, the young immigrant from Canada on uh, the west coast of the United States. Uh, <laughs> yes, he's 92 and still kicking, you know, uh, incredible, you know, these architects. So the best engineer, this is, this is a statement relating to what I uh, tried to uh, say earlier. The best engineer a few decades ago was someone who could create the most beautiful beam or structure. Today it's to do a structure you cannot see or understand how it's done. It disappears and you can talk only about color, symbols, and light. It's an aesthetic of miracles. This is what Jean Nouvel thinks. Anyway. Uh, he's posing a little bit. He's a star. He's supposed to. The new police headquarters in Belgium, in Charles Charleroi. Uh, this is indeed a police station. Too much so. I uh, I kind of dislike this building because it's too vehemently uh, expressing authority and verticality and uh, and uh, other things. Uh, what can you say? It's a police headquarters, so maybe it was supposed to be like this. But I'm not, I, I don't think Jean Nouvel was unaware of the connotations of what he was going to build. I think he intended that, to express authority and power and uh, maybe even a little bit of sadism. I don't know. Anyway, I wouldn't play games or not rebellious games in this town in Belgium, knowing that the... <laughs> The police has headquarters looks like this. No way. I mean, <laughs> I think this. I think this city or this town has uh, uh, the least problems in the world with, um, you know, uh, delinquency. You know, uh, with, uh, you you cannot allow yourself to be deviant in such a city because you see this tower is communicating to you all the time that uh, you are seen and you will be punished, and you will be found, and uh, you will be uh, destroyed. So you better abstain from any extravagant uh, behavior. <laughs> Here is the architect as a shadow, and now it's the shadow as well. Well, it's not a shadow, but it's, uh, the photograph is done in a certain way. And we arrived at uh, Gal Galerie uh, uh, Fondation Cartier in Paris, which is a nice building. You don't quite know. You don't quite know uh, what is reflection and what is so-called reality or concreteness. It is very interesting. I have been there and it's a uh, uh, place with ambi ambiguity is very interesting. 
I only hope I have other pictures with it. Uh, he wrote this architecture is only a movie. Yes, I have other pictures. So you don't know what is this, you know, is the park, is the path, it's actually the reflection through the building. It's a view inside the building. Very interesting. Uh, Fondation Cartier, yes, that's the building. When you will be famous, I'm talking to with the, with the students here. And maybe not just with the students, with anyone except me. You will have a chance to have an exhibition at Fondation Cartier. They do have exhibitions on, on architecture. Uh, so they welcome such exhibitions. And once you have an exhibition at, at Fondation Cartier, immediately China will call you on the phone and tell you that they want to build another performance art center, uh, you know, for one million people, and you are invited immediately to start working on it. Um, so it's good to have an exhibition at Fondation Cartier. That's that's what I'm trying to say. It helps one's career. Um, it's not far away from Saint Pierre Montparnasse, uh, where many celebrities are buried, uh, and you might even have surprises there. For example, I saw the great uh, French poet Jacques Baudelaire has two tombs, two graves. He's buried in two graves, if you can believe it. It's one where he's alone, and is one where he is with his parents, where adopted father and mother. Anyway. There are other strange things there, you know, the great sculptor Brancusi, uh, Romanian, is also buried with another pair. With, there are three people there under, under the stone. And uh, anyway, uh, yes, Fondation Cartier, the trees love it because the trees are both reflected and unreflected, but uh, highly present. Um, no, no, it is a good building. That Expo 02 in Switzerland, which I like, it shows his uh, confrontational uh, um, morbidity in a way, you know, it's rusted, it's corten, it's rusted, but it's still a cube and it's floating precariously uh, on water. And you wonder how come, but it does. So it's some kind of a premonition. I, I actually think uh, Jean Nouvel is not unaware of the limits of life, meaning particularly death. And I see this in this uh, uh, architectural provocation. Um, it is impressive and it is, uh, it almost gives you shivers if you think a little more about it and what it might mean. It's some kind of a mausoleum, you know, floating on water or giving the impression that it is floating. Um, anyway. Yeah, so very different from uh, Teatro del Mundo of Aldo Rossi and other attempts at architecture or water. But this one doesn't really seem to float. It seems anchored there or miraculously not sinking, but really not kind of floating because it looks very heavy. Now we have a uh, building, uh, kind of black in France, then Torre Akbar in Barcelona, uh, which you know probably uh, is another police station. Well, it's not a police station, but makes me think of that police uh, headquarters in Belgium. Um, when Eric Miraes told me uh, once that they don't build tall buildings in Barcelona or in uh, Spain, uh, that was um, almost 30 years ago, 25 years ago. It's not like this any longer, obviously. Uh, anyway, it's an interesting tower. Um, yeah. Can I interject just one thing? Please. Um, that tower, unless it was uh, sold, it's, uh, it, it belongs to the, the, um, the water company. It's, okay. not, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a police station. I didn't say, you misunderstood me. I, ah, okay, I okay. made a reference to the police headquarters in Belgium. Okay, okay. Also on tower. Okay, my, my apologies then. It's okay. And it doesn't really matter, but it, it, it is an interesting building. Um, so I, I was referring to, to, to this building that I showed before. Give it to me. No. That's going to be between me and the box. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know? Yeah, 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 I understand, I understand. Sorry, I, my apologies. I was, it's okay, I was it's okay. It's I understood fine, that you were saying the same function. It's fine, thank you. Okay, so we, we move forward. Uh, so we are now in Barcelona. We'll also see a park done by him in Barcelona. Of course, he had to do one to compete with uh, Antoni Gaudi. Uh, and uh, you'll see his work. And it's kind of interesting that he became a little bit a horticulturalist, culturalist, horticulture, horticulturalist. God, I'm beginning to be unable to 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 talk properly, and I apologize. Uh, it's not a modest tower. Towers in general are not modest. This one is maybe particularly modest because it's surrounded by what is surrounded. But anyway, uh, another skyscraper. This is kind of interesting. Unfortunately, it was not built, but it was done also by Jean Nouvel. And it shows his repertoire, to use a word that uh, um, Patrick Schumacher likes, the word repertoire. Um, it shows that he has a kind of a large uh, repertoire. Now, this is the park in Barcelona that um, I mentioned. And this uh, is Kind of interesting, although I prefer the one by um, by uh, Gaudi. Uh, but it's it's uh, you know uh, almost polemical a little bit, uh, and it shows a certain level of fragility that uh, maybe is appropriate for our time. Uh, maybe it's not yet developed. Maybe the the trees and the bushes didn't yet grow. Uh, as, as he intended uh, in his design, uh, but look at this uh, gate. You know, it's so it's kind of like that tower in Cyprus, where the the the, the openings in the in the in, in the gate are uh, you know uh, pixelated and um, you know kind of informal and improvised and spontaneous. They are uh, um, uh, this is a ripped. Uh, entrance into the building or exit. It has uh, these um, openings that are uh, in a way communicating the fragility of life, that even the most solid anything in time will be eaten up by the passage of time and uh, elements and so on. Uh, again, I would say some kind of an impressionistic gesture. And co that which connects in a way with what is around it, and that is the 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 the, the, the crown of flowers, the flowers, the vegetation, the plants. So you have the work of man, and you have the work of God or nature, both. Uh, you know, and then a little pavilion, and then uh, uh, I don't know. It, it's it's more fragile, and in a way, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good work for our time. Um, but it's possible that in time it will evolve uh, into something maybe a little different. Here, I think he is with the mayor of Barcelona, uh, if I remember correctly. And you see almost his trademark in a way. You have the structure, you have the grid, you have the order, the panel, and then you have the the you know the, the holes which are aleatory and uh, a little bit disorienting. But you have like two systems in a way coexisting. The Fira Hotel in Barcelona also interesting and also interesting because of this. <laughs> this unusual window which connects with what I said earlier about uh, sabotaging, uh, you know, a more or less rational structure with uh, an intervention that just like in the, just like in the gate here, you know, he does it also at a different scale in the building. And what an unusual window, you know, it's, uh, he's, a, he's a, an adventurer, uh, an iconoclast. I mean, who would have done such a window, you know? <laughs> Look at it. It's built, it's not just drawn. 
anyway. Um, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, a modernistic structure with an audacious um, cantilevered, uh, and I don't know how to call it, uh, you know, balcony or, uh, I don't know, the word balcony is not, is not quite appropriate, but it has a certain function and you'll see why. I think here is the, the frontier between uh, two states and I forgot what the, those the, uh, states are in the states. Uh, otherwise, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a theater factory in a way. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a factory for uh, playing theater. And on the left, uh, I think is the portrait of Antoine Chekhov, if I'm not wrong. But I don't know the one on the right. And the one on the left all the way is uh, Bernard Shaw. Um, Bernard Shaw, who said, for example, something interesting. He said, when there are two people in a room, there are actually six people. There is, let's say, it's me and someone else. It's me, it's me the way I think I am. It's me the way the other person thinks I am. And it's me the way I really am. And it's symmetrical is the same with the other person. Is uh, you the way I think you are? Is you the way you truly are? And it is you the way you think you are. So there are actually six people, not two. This is about the only thing I know about Bernard Shaw. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is a typical Jean Nouvel, yes. Red, like the Serpentine Gallery uh, in London. Uh, and uh, then the cantilever part is uh, uh, with difficulty you could find a, a, you know, a parallel unless you think about the 75 or 73 meters uh, cantilever by Calatrava in Rio de Janeiro. Um, but here at least you can walk on that thing and contemplate with in number 12. I mean, at, at, uh, not at the bottom, but uh, at the top, contemplate the frontier between two states in the United States. And I think we, we, I have a picture with that, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but it could also represent, <clears throat> you know, the, the provocation of theater, of playing, that it, it, it is theater maybe at its best. It's, uh, an incitation, it, it incites people, it, it uh, provokes them, it, uh, it uh, yeah, it, um, it, uh, if it's a good theater, it shouldn't leave you indifferent. Uh, and yeah, there you see the frontier. I forgot, unfortunately, what the two states were, uh, ah, but maybe it's not, you see, a lady is contemplating uh, the other state. So there is the frontier, so to speak, between two states, both in the United States. Uh, and um, we move forward now, the National Museum of, of Qatar in Doha. This is the last work I show, and I think is a very special work, uh, not because <laughs> I find some legitimacy in some of my scribblings, because I used to do this for almost 20 years, things kind of similar, but I am very happy it was built and it doesn't seem to be so capricious as it might appear. And I will explain why. So this is the building. You would say, wow, what is this? But it was actually inspired by the sand roads of Qatar, which is this. It's kind of, a, that's how it is called, the sand roads. And it's some kind of, uh, you know, a crystallized plant, if I can say so. A sand rose, so he was inspired. It doesn't exist only in Qatar; it exists in other in other countries as well. But he chose it as an inspiration for his work. And look at it, you know, it's it's incredible that here is the same architect who did the Minneapolis uh, Theater and the Tower in Barcelona. So he is very free. And yes, there are some. Uh, uh, traces of, uh, you know, uh, a certain style, if we have to use a word which I usually avoid. But, but essentially, he's a modern man 
who uh, experiments and who tries new things all the time, and here maybe more radically than in some other cases. Yeah, he still likes uh, the circle and uh, differently than uh, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, but um, otherwise he welcomes the disorder of uh, aleatory composition, if I can say so, and, and this is shown also on the level of uh, ornamentation, if I can use this word, when you look at how the surface is treated. Uh, it's an interesting work and uh, it's courageous, it's a little bit uh, frivolous as well, but uh, so is the, the, the work of God actually, because I mean, Jesus, what did I say? Please erase, forget what I just said. But I do believe, and I even wrote once a so-called small poem where I said that I was defending the amateurs. And I think, I thought that even God was kind of amateur. And he, I mean, he didn't create a perfect world. He created a, wor a work with problems. But making that work, creating the world, he was playful, I think. Uh, and sometimes in a more, um, you know, uh, painful way, other times in a sweet way. And so are these uh, the creators, these architects. He's playful, he's capricious, he's frivolous sometimes. He squanders the money of, of gas, you know, because of oil, because we are talking about oil here. I mean, because of the oil, we have this building. Without the oil, they would have never been able to build in Qatar such a building. But <laughs> thanks to the oil, thanks to the extraction, uh, you know, Nouvelle built his building. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the laborers uh, labored at it, uh, all right. And uh, I hope they earned some good money. They were probably immigrants, many of them. So they needed the money badly. But look at the site, look at the building site, my God. You know, uh, I wonder how the working drawings were. They were probably uh, astonishingly difficult. And people had to put up with them and build this thing. Uh, why not? Building chaos. But wasn't really chaos. It's organized chaos because you see, he still uses the circle. You know, he loves the circle. You know, but, but he also flirts with, uh, with disorder. By the way of disorder, an American mathematician, maybe you've heard me saying this before, invented the word, not order, not disorder, not chaos, but, but this chaos. Well, please think about this word, this chaos. What could that mean? Uh, inside, is, uh, there isn't so too much chaos or this chaos, or maybe it is this chaos, but not uh, disorder. Uh, and maybe some beautiful textiles, the woven things, uh, you know, rugs and so on. I don't know, uh, machineries, and uh, I don't know what, what they are, probably having to do with, with the riches of Qatar based on extraction of, 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 uh, of the oil. Anyway, a museum, I can a museum, but look at the site plan, look at, the, look at it from above. You know, who saw such a building before? Not too many people. Uh, and look at the plan. Can you believe it? I mean, this is, this is a scattered plan. These are remnants of a building. These are, you know, like, uh, how do you call it? Like clothes or, you know, they are just uh, ashes of building. So the National Museum of Qatar in Doha has ashes of buildings. Interesting. <laughs> well, you can get along with this if your name is Jean Nouvel. Again and again, you take risks, you might lose, but you could also win. He took risks, he won. He won in the sense that he built his, uh, his building. Uh, those circles, I still have problems with. But when I don't see the circle, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not against the circle. I love uh, Villa Rotonda, Palladio, but there you don't have this sort of plan. 
you know, he, he, he has a problem with this. And we saw it at the Louvre as well. You know, he has that beautiful, spontaneous uh, bazaar, I call it, or, you know, uh, aleatory movement, a little building. And then he tops them with that centralized, perfect uh, cupola or dome. Here also, you know, you have this kind of plan. And then look at the top, even if he has them uh, uh, slanted or, you know, uh, at a certain angle, they, they are still uh, the circles. But here they are a little bit less seen as such because of the intersection between them. Anyway, um, and sections, they are just suggested here. I couldn't find the better sections and they are hard to, 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 to look at and then I apologize. Um, in a way, I think he was not, I, I, I actually think this building was kind of like what Lebius Woods recommended when he said, we should first build our buildings and then learn how to live in them. I, I, I think he, I don't think he controlled all the spaces uh, from, uh, from the beginning, uh, you know. I think he had some uh, discoveries, uh, you know, uh, certain spaces just, just happened because of these maddening intersections between various planes. Actually, the sections don't quite suggest the complexity of the of the of the composition, as you as you can see here. Anyway, uh, he is uh, reinventing himself, and uh, maybe uh, ninety or one hundred, he will become a father again, and at one hundred ten again, and at one hundred twenty, once again. So. I end the presentation on, on, on him with this uh, beautiful and uh, puzzling a little bit uh, rose, uh, sand rose, even its name, sand rose. It's a rose of the desert in a way, which is uh, it's not really part of the vegetable world. It's not really a plant, but it is maybe. I, I don't know enough about flora. Anyway, Don't you now. I don't know if you still have the power to follow me. I'm, I think to talk about Christian de Porzon Park after Jean Nouvel could be a little bit uh, less challenging, uh, but if you want, I'll, I'll make the presentation because here he is. So it's up to you. <laughs> Those of you who are still here with me, you decide. Done. It's longer, it's less long than the one uh, about the Then may, may I ask you if possible to show the plan of the number one new change again? Of what? Which plan? The, the plan of the new number one new change in London. You mean the department store? Yes. Well, <laughs> I, it's probably a, some some a slide before this one. I mean, I you could send you the, do you want to no, say something? I, no, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, no, I don't want to have the, the slide myself. I just wanted to make a point on it simply because what I noticed from what I just saw in your presentation is that the plan is a cross with, uh, with the central space. Uh, which is a uh, circular and being right on the opposite of the cathedral is almost like turning the cathedral inside out and that that is quite interesting in a way if if he's playing that sort of game is kind of uh, not only a kind of bringing the addressing the, the presence of the cathedral by opening uh, the building towards it, but also on the plan is reflecting the cathedral as well. So is he, is he building a, a, an, an open form of cathedral there? The, it, so it was a it was something that I thought it would be interesting for for discussion because 
of the reason that he, he designed that building in a way that he has on the plan, he, he kind of creates some curiosities. Well, uh, your, your uh, intervention, uh, Azar, is, is very uh, uh, welcome and uh, um, I think uh, uh, provocative uh, in the good sense of the word. Uh, so if I understood correctly, you are suggesting or you are asking yourself and us if he didn't uh, actually, um, well, I don't see that, I mean, yeah, it's not really a cross, it, or it is a deformed cross. Yeah, it is a deformed cross, then, yes. Um, yeah, uh, it is a deformed cross, and it's interesting that you mentioned this, because if I understood correctly, you wanted to say that it's almost like a cathedral in reverse. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm not sure is 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 for me is that to understand what he was thinking. You know, what what was his line of thinking when he was designing? So um his thought process is, is quite exciting, becomes exciting now that why would he do a deformed cross in front of a building which has got a very strong rigid cr cross with a dome and he in the center of the cross in the in the conjunctions of two parts of the cross he also has a circle which is open to the sky and instead of a dome the sky becomes its, its dome what I, you know i'm questioning all that to see to get to the reason behind the form of this building. Why did he do it? Why, you know, uh, why is it in this form? Well, I, I, I think your, uh, your observation is very legitimate. Uh, we already agreed that, uh, you know, he has a dialogue with the cathedral, and maybe that dialogue, as you said, is actually more subtle and, and deeper uh, with, with the dimension or dimensions that you just mentioned, because also in terms of functions, maybe you know, but uh, uh, in a way, fashion replaced religion in the present. And this is very uh, uh, artistically very well uh, uh, touched upon in that movie by uh, the great Federico Fellini, which I keep recommending Roma or Rome where uh, Fellini shows a fashion show inside the Vatican. Here we have a big, in essence, you know, this big uh, department store is dedicated to fashion. And then you have the house of God, you have the cathedral. So you have on the left in the plan religion and on the right we have fashion. So, you know, I can, I could read a, 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 maybe this plan in this way, that the department store uh, is the, the new religion, the mall. The mall is the new religion. We would die without going to the mall. We would die without changing our clothes. Fashion is so important for us because we are bored, because we don't have that faith that, you know, people of other times had. So I see here some kind of dialogue, and I think, Azar, you are totally correct that it is a dialogue between the two forms of faith, the mm -hmm. faith of the past in God and the faith of the present in fashion with a deformed cross and uh, everything else that you mentioned. Kind, kind of something like this, the mirror image, but in reverse. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah, the, uh, uh, it, it, it is some kind of a, uh, you know, this is our religion today. It's fashion. Uh, and uh, to say otherwise is to lie. Yes, we still build churches, but uh, not very convincingly. There are exceptions, of course, like in Barcelona. But uh, essentially, fashion, I even had a book. There is a book, I think, by Mark Taylor, if I remember correctly the name, 
and, and unfortunately I gave it to someone and I even forgot to whom I gave it. No, I didn't forget, but I cannot find that person. It's an American book on fashion and faith uh, and compares uh, the two. A very interesting book with a pink uh, cover. I have to find that book again. Anyway, uh, thank you, Azar. I think your intervention is, is, uh, is very appropriate. Well, thank you. Thank you. So could I go back now to Christian? <laughs> I mean, if you if you still want to see the, the presentation on Christian the Portson Park, I, I think I still have some energy left in me. I could do it, but I don't want to tire you off. So uh, it's up to you, the audience uh, who is with me here now, uh, you decide. Sorry about this. Maybe there is a more uh, less irritating way to do this, but I, I, I'm afraid to disturb the system. Uh, it's also a review of what I showed with, uh, with a more or less high speed. Okay, so this is Christian de Porzon Park. If you have uh, uh, 20 minutes more or half an hour, I can, I can show you his work. If not, we can leave yeah. it for some other time. It's up to you, really. Carry on then, if for me it's fine. I don't know about the others. Okay, well anyway, everybody is free. You can come, you can go, you can go and have a lemonade or something, or even a steak. Anyway, I'll begin. Christian de Portson Park, the other Pritzker Prize winner, besides um, uh, Monsieur Nouvelle, uh, this is uh, an interesting building, I think, built by him in uh, Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. I think it's one of his better buildings uh, because it has a certain vitality, which I, which I admire. But we'll come back to that. Um, now, unfortunately, we are contemplating a building that is less spectacular, less cultural, less dynamic. Uh, although the students here like it because it's, this is kind of the spirit of, uh, of the architecture they like. Uh, it's more quiet and more, uh, you know, in a way more uh, subdued and, and, and uh, classic. Anyway, this is a side of uh, Christian de Porzon Park which I don't like so much, but it's a decent building, I guess. And, you know, if Luxembourg is, is happy with it, what can I say? Uh, inside it has some, uh, because of the colors and there is a certain movement, he can be a little more adventurous and uh, I think I'll show a few buildings where he is a little more adventurous than in this one. Uh, but compared to Nouvelle, he's a little bit less iconoclastic, uh, but he's still a good architect. I like though this building, which is one of his earliest, if not his first building, uh, is this one. A water tower. Uh, I like it. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, water tower, whatever it is, it, it's a nice building. Of course, there were such buildings uh, built in history, uh, but uh, I don't know. And it's quite monumental when you look at its scale. And you wouldn't actually expect it from Christian de Porzon Park, but he did it. Uh, so he is a man capable of surprises and surprising us. Um, okay, Lille, Tour Credit Lyonnais, of course, uh, the banks are uh, the friends of uh, the successful architects. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a bank, what can you say? It's a bank that wants to say, here I am and I'm strong and vital and all the rest. Bring your money to us. And you do, you are when you see this building, probably. Anyway, uh, I won't insist too much um, on this bank. Uh, very few banks I like, maybe those jewel boxes by uh, Sullivan, yes. Le Tour Sisters, the Sisters Towers. Uh, this is a project, uh, and I don't think he built them. Uh, I, I don't even know where, maybe in Paris. Yes, in Paris, near, near the La Tour de la Défense, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, 
even uh, Paul uh, Andre worked. He worked with the uh, with the Danish architect of that building. He contributed to that building, which I don't think is so great. But this canopy here is by a great engineer, Peter Rice. Uh, and uh, anyway, there are other important names around here. These were the sister towers proposed by um, by Christian de Portson Park, but he didn't build them yet. Um, the greatest loss, I think, is the tower that uh, Tom Main proposed here at La Defense. That one was not built either yet. Now, this is an interesting kind of a nice building, uh, smaller building by uh, Christian de Portson Park. Christian Dior, a fashion again in Seoul. You know, it's uh, sculpturally lyrical or lyrically sculptural. Uh, he indulged himself, of course, because the money was there and it has to do with fashion. But I think he did a good job and uh, why not? Um, Anyway, fashion is fashion. What can we say? Uh, and some uh, people are doing well doing fashion, which is temporary. Uh, Oscar Wilde had some uh, <laughs> sarcastic words about fashion, saying that it's a terrible thing. That's why it, it needs to change every six months. Um, anyway. What is amazing is the price you have to pay for some of these items, you know, it's unbelievable. I mean, they are not for human beings, really, they are for gods and goddesses, you know, where a belt costs 2,000 euros, you know, they are not for <laughs> mortals. Anyway, uh, yes, you see the architect uh, full of angst to establish the right uh, aesthetics of the building. Uh, he did it. It was built in Seoul. And on the right there, there seems to be the communistic uh, Soviet uh, star at the top, kind of funny, no? Um, the sketch of the genius. Um, <laughs> I was a little bit uh, malicious here. The stair is, uh, you know, hallucinating. I mean, you are hallucinating if you work on it because there are some uh, reflections here and you don't quite know what's going on. Maybe it's just a distorted picture. Um, so it was built in, in the factory and that, the, I, uh, you know, certainly not through that door. They took out this, <laughs> this large, otherwise called detail. Here is the architect, uh, a little bit, um, you know, uh, humbled by his own success um, or mimicking modesty uh, a little bit. Um, so, the good life. This is a good building uh, and if you arrive in Paris at, uh, at the Beauvais uh, um, airport, uh, then a bus will bring you very close to this Palais de Congrès, uh, the Palace of uh, Congresses in Paris. It's kind of similar to the building in Brazil, and we'll, we'll see that building again. We see François Truffaut there, the great French uh, director, and of course on the right, the worst dress painter in the world, that is Pablo Picasso. I would never understand. The same way I do not understand how uh, Renzo Piano dresses so badly, I never understood how Picasso, who was the, 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 the great painter, uh, dresses so badly. But in the case of Picasso, there was an explanation. Apparently, he received clothes from the best designers uh, because they wanted publicity to have the great painter wear the coat and trousers and whatever. So the painter just threw them on, on him. This didn't seem to be the case with Renzo Piano. Sorry, that, that, that sweater didn't seem that it was, it was not designed by Giorgio Armani or anything. It was just, I don't know carelessness, but when you have a certain status, maybe you can afford to be even careless. So this is the Palace of Congresses uh, uh, by, by uh, Christian de Portson Park. Uh, he has a, a little bit of funny and difficult name, de Portson Park. It probably has some nobility in him. 
Uh, Miss van der Rohe, as I said, uh, he wanted so much to have uh, that in his name, and he didn't. And then he added van der because the Dutch allowed it, but not the Germans. So he became quasi quasi a uh, nobleman. Now we have a tower in uh, in uh, New York. Uh, the Pritzker Prize laureate, of course, has to build a tower too uh, in in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, yeah, to me, he's a little more predictable than Jean Nouvel. And look at these waves on the facade. Are they really great architecture? I don't know. I'm not so convinced. But these titillations, these fibrillations of the facade, you know, uh, kind of a facile, um, you know, uh, I don't know, aestheticism. But we have seen worse with Michael Graves, so why not uh, Christian de Portson Park? Uh, tall it is, all right, it is tall. And people are running uh, on these things which go nowhere, but it's okay, you have to keep in shape, uh, even if you run nowhere. Uh, I, I never quite understood these health clubs. Um, I mean, I understand them, but they seem kind of ridiculous to me. And uh, this is not his tower, it's the tower near, the tallest is actually done by SHOP, S-H-O-P, uh, which has a very small uh, uh, base, uh, and it's very, very slender, and as you can see, very, very tall. But the one on the left, the next tall is by Christian de Portson Park, both facing uh, Central Park West, um, uh, Central Park, sorry. I, so I was thinking of, uh, of John Lennon, I said this before, he was killed around here uh, in the Dakota house at 72nd Street uh, in front of his building, uh, apparently the most expensive uh, housing, uh, you know, um, apartment building in, in Manhattan, if not the world, but he was killed uh, at 40. And now we have another tower by, uh, by Christian de Portson Park, uh, why not? Uh, you know, acceptable, but would you say it's great? I don't know. I, I still think the, the, the tower by uh, the one I call neo-Gothic or modern Gothic by Jean Nouvel is more interesting. But it was built. And uh, this will do. 404 Park Avenue South. This is a proposal. I don't think it was built yet. Uh, so here's a New Yorkers like him, uh, obviously. No, it was built. Incredible. Uh, it even has an entrance. Nice. So this building, though, I think is one of, of the better ones. It resembles the Palace of Congresses in Rio de Janeiro. And it has vigor, it has movement, it has uh, sculptural qualities. I think it's a good work by, by uh, Christian de Portson Park. Uh, and uh, water is also, seem, uh, also seems to like it somehow. The water enters into the building and under the building, kind of like in, uh, in the case of Lina Bobardi, a great architect I, 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 I will always admire. And we have to, we'll talk one evening about Lina Bobardi. Um, and so this is the building with the functions and everything. And uh, we are approaching the end. So please be patient with me, the, the 11 uh, people who are still here with me. And uh, yes, we are in Rio de Janeiro before the pandemic, uh, gloriously celebrating water, the ocean, exuberance, music, dance, and everything else. Or as uh, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso would say, uh, and anything or everything in between. Okay, so um, concrete still has uh, the, the power to seduce us. I like concrete. I know it's not uh, ecological. There are problems with it, I know, but uh, in terms of artistic expression, I, I like its roughness sometimes, and uh, it has a vigor and a certain honesty. Although Frank Lloyd Wright, I know he did dislike it. He said it's a conglomerate. 
but it is a, I don't know, a kind of a convincing conglomerate. Anyway, uh, Christian de Porton Park is not always very convincing, but uh, this building is not too bad. Cidade das Artes, you know, we actually I'm a little bit afraid of these uh, cities of arts, you know, sometimes I don't know, is it really what we need? But maybe society feels guilty and the banks and the governments because many artists die of hunger and uh, they are not recognized. So they build these cities, Cidades das Artes, but I don't know who, who, who arrives there, you know? Still the official ones, those recognized, but there are so many who are not recognized and maybe they deserve sometimes to be present and recognized as well. Anyway, um, life is difficult for artists in general and for the poets even more. The poets are always the ones who die the youngest and the architects are the ones who die the, the latest, the, 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 the latest time. You know, they live the longest, the architects. I always tell the students here, you know, the school is not going to guarantee you a, a job, but it will guarantee you a long life. And they smile. <laughs> and who wouldn't smile? You know, who cares? You will be jobless. But at least you know you live forever, or almost forever. Like uh, many architects. Eisenman is 90, Frampton is 90, Frank Gehr is 92. Well, Zaha Hadid uh, unfortunately died younger, but many architects live, 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 live long lives. While well, Philip Johnson was 99. Well, we are talking about Brazil, right? Oscar Niemeyer, 102, I think, or 103. Jesus. You know, uh, <laughs> let, let everybody be an architect. Okay, so here is the plan, less tormenting than the Doha building by uh, Jean Nouvel, uh, but uh, still uh, having movement and drama and uh, an interesting section. And Nexus 2 in Japan, uh, this is strange, you know, it reminds me of Michael Graves and uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want to be reminded of him. Um, so I go quickly over this tower is actually, I, I actually am not sure, was it done by Christian de Corson Park or Michael Graves? Now a cultural center in China and this is the last work I show. Uh, it's in construction now. And it is uh, the same China that likes adventures and the extravagant uh, architectural uh, statements. We have here uh, an intertwining and the twisting, because twisting is very fashionable these days. Med Architects built the Wood Museum, also twisted. And of course, there is a bridge building by Ang Ingalls, also twisted. And there are the twists in today's architecture. And here is a rendering and another rendering, maybe not so spectacular. What's going on? The Turma Sena, I miss, and now I was wrong. Uh, but I will arrive at that, that project again, unfortunately. The, the sister towers, other, or no, the same ones for Paris, which were not built. Uh, we saw some uh, pictures of it before. A winery, uh, Cheval Blanc. Uh, I have a feeling like a true Frenchman from uh, Portson Park Labs wine. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the winery. Uh, wineries have money, of course. <laughs> so they can experiment architecturally too. So there, there are famous wineries in the world. This is by Christian de Portson Park, who probably is. Uh, as a subscription to this uh, winemaker and receives uh, constantly new wine uh, freely, of course. Um, anyway, so we move forward. The wine is doing well in our world. It's not afraid of the virus, not afraid of the coronavirus. As we are a museum in Belgium, I kind of, I don't know, a little cheaply pop, but why not? The Prisker Prize was already assured. The flowers are colorful, uh, and that's what counts. I, I don't think he's one of the really, really, really the best architects in the world, but he's, he's okay. 
uh, we accept him in our club, especially when he uses color or colors, vivid colors. We love vivid colors here. They are not so vivid, at least in the picture, but they are probably better in the so-called reality. Uh, and the citadel in the Netherlands, a kind of a strange building, uh, a department store, of course, um, a little bit pop, has some pop elements, but not very strident. And uh, here is also another cross, Azar, uh, although there is no cathedral of St. Paul, but again, we see a cross. Now I'm beginning to search for crosses in department stores. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, move forward. People are happy. You look at this advertising. Who would say that life is difficult? You know, the, everything works, you know, uh, everything. The teeth are white and impeccable, the clothes, the, everything is fine. Okay, uh, and uh, Hotel Renaissance in Paris. I don't know about this. He tires me off with his uh, waves on the facade, really. <laughs> really, please, Mr. Porzon Park, please don't do it again, please. Uh, abstain, please. Uh, in the name of the general public, please don't do it again. You did it twice. It's about time to stop. And uh, uh, what else? Uh, ah, this wave. The City of Music from 1990. This is an early building. The East Wing, there are two wings, the East and West Wing. Uh, I'm even confused now which one is East and which one is West. Um, anyway, this is the West, West Wing, yeah, I knew one was much more ample, and is this one, uh, you know, more, more dramatic, so to speak, uh, and uh, much more ample. Um, you can see Nouvelle not far away, I still prefer Nouvelle's building, the Philharmonica, Philharmonic, than, than the building by the House of Music by Portson Park. Uh, headquarters for the press group Le Monde, uh, and Le Monde it is, uh, the map of the world is there, um, the headquarters, not bad to build for Le Monde, uh, the headquarters must be okay. Now I don't know what this is, uh, another uh, architectural titillation, and now, what is this, a building in Morocco, in Casablanca, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it was built. I see here the model, uh, the rendering. Uh, he was born in Casablanca, Christian de Porzon Park. So he was commissioned by uh, Casablanca also to build uh, something in the city, in his native city. And in fact, the presentation will end uh, accordingly uh, relating to Casablanca, you'll see very soon. Uh, the sketch of the Pritzker Price Laureate. And then, uh, ah, yes, it is in construction. Maybe, maybe by now it's done already. And, uh, uh, okay, I am accelerating a little bit because you are probably tired uh, as well. Uh, but we, we surveyed his work uh, to Nantes. God, there are much, uh, many more works by him. I did, I forgot. Uh, he built so many, um, you know, housing uh, and uh, playfulness a little bit, and he doesn't, well, maybe he looks a little bit playful here. The apartment building, blocks of flats, nothing really very, very important. And Luxembourg Philharmonia we saw, uh, now we come in, in uh, to investigate it a little in more detail. Uh, it's more interesting inside perhaps than outside, uh, but, why not? For Luxembourg, it works, I think, um, because I don't think it's such an adventurous country to begin with, or city even. Um, okay. Anyway, um, I showed this picture before, and I like this this boy who brings some life in in the in the picture. And this is the last work. 
the Suzhou Cultural Center in China, which is now in construction. <clears throat> and uh, it shows this uh, twisting, wind, which I anticipating, and this intertwining. And uh, so you, you almost see two entities uh, trying to, to cohabit, to live together, although they have the, the distinct personalities. And uh, yeah, it's the fluidity that he accustomed us with, but he's not the only one, of course, doing that. Here in the plan, you see the, <clears throat> this uh, Möbius almost, uh, you know, uh, and almost. And, you know, you could say that it, does, it is an attempt <clears throat> to bring together two entities or two principles that otherwise uh, are, are individualistic, individu individualistically uh, predisposed or, 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 or defined. So it's some kind of a tango between two people, if you want, uh, or two entities, as I said, or two principles. And now we come to this. I wrote something here that Christian de Porzon Park was born in Casablanca. You can see below a few images from the famous film Casablanca, considered the beautiful love story. And in a way, this is what is all about in architecture as well. Love. It is all about love, love and passion. Thank you. So, uh, you know, maybe not all works show this love and this passion. But essentially, I think uh, if we succeed in bringing together either the Cathedral of uh, St. Paul with a department store in London by Jean Nouvel, or Ingrid Bergman with uh, Humphrey Bogart. If we bring together two entities or two principles that are uh, uh, by birth kind of opposed, uh, something uh, interesting could happen. Because you have conflict, you have tension, you have, you know, uh, looking into each other's eyes with, uh, with uh, <laughs> great intensity. Uh, you have embracing and you have, uh, in, in essence, you have love. Thank you very much. That's it. Nothing else today. Thank you very much, Dad. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who was this one? Who, how thank you? So no. let me see who is here still. Uh, let me see. I see almost everybody. I do not know Christian, uh, Christian or Christian Dinglasan, and I don't know Francesca. I know Judith. I know Melissa. I know Michaela, and I, I know Vatsal. So maybe Christian, Christian. I don't know how you pronounce your name, and Francesca will say something about themselves. So uh, we introduce each other, if you want. <laughs> Should I uh, click on uh, unmute? Ah, Francesca, I, I already saw uh, there was, yes. Francesca. Yeah, I was trying to. Where uh, are you from? Bună seara. Hello to everyone. Greetings. Bună seara. Um, <laughs> I'm a future architecture student and I really enjoy your presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, now, uh, the only one person I do not know anything about is David. Uh, no, no, not David Castanier. I know Christian. Sorry, David. Being Glassan, uh, I, I, I don't know him. But you are not forced to divulge your identity in any way. Uh, if you want to say anything, uh, you are welcome, of course. Ben? 